Good morning, members, officers, and uh, members of the public who are joining the live stream of this meeting. Uh, welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee. My name is Councillor Michael Atkins, and I am the chair of the committee. As this is the first meeting of the municipal year, I would like to thank the previous committee for their work. Um, I'm delighted that Councillors uh, Heather Williams, Joe Hales, and Jeff Harvey have kindly agreed to serve on the committee again, and I would like to welcome Councillors uh, Peter Sanford, Vice Chair, uh, Richard Stobart, and Helen Leeming to the committee. Uh, please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone that is currently switched on, so you're advised to wait a few seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with you. If you're participating in the meeting via the live stream, I don't believe we have uh, any uh, members of the committee on the live stream, um, but if you wish to speak, uh, please do so via the chat function, uh, but do not use the chat function for any other purpose. Um, please make sure your device is fully charged and that you keep your microphone on mute unless you are invited to do so. Uh, please switch off or silence any other devices so they do not interrupt the proceedings. Uh, consider using a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth so that we can hear you clearly. And finally, when you're invited to address the meeting, make sure you switch your microphone on and then immediately switch it off again after you have finished speaking. Please speak slowly and clearly and do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Some nice advice for life, that. Agenda item one, apologies. Uh, Patrick, are there any apologies for today? No, Chair, we have no apologies. Every single committee member is present. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, agenda item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to any item of business on the agenda? Um, if it subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please raise it then. Uh, Councillor Sackford. I should probably note that I'm a non-remunerated director of South Cam's Limited Trading as Ermin Street Housing Thank you very much. Are there any other, uh, Councillor Heather Williams? Thank you, Chair. Um, there are references to city deals and things in relation to the Greater Cambridge Partnership, of which I'm Assembly Member. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. And Councillor Joseph Hales? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not sure if this is actually a declaration, but um, I'm a trustee of Noble Mobile Warden Scheme, which receives a grant from South Cambridge as part of its Mobile Warden funding. But Thank you. Um, I'm, um, uh, I've just been appointed director, uh, the South Cam's, one of the South Cam's directors for um, South Cambridgeshire Investment Partnership and uh, South Cambridgeshire Holdings LLP. So the two, two boards. Thank you, Richard. Um, Patrick, have you got all of those? Fantastic. Okay, agenda item three, minutes of the previous meetings. Um, we've got before us uh, minutes of the meetings held on the 29th of March and the 7th of April. Uh, first of all, I need to ask if they're a correct record. Yes, Councillor? Just to mention, I wasn't present on the 29th of March, so I'll abstain from that um, item in case you were thinking of taking them together. Uh, I mean, I was just going to take them by affirmation, but um, unless you're... That's fine. Um, I, I will take a vote in that case. Um, there was one action uh, arising uh, from the meeting of the uh, 29th of March, um, which was a topical question from Councillor Mark Howell as to whether the Council had any direct investments with Russian gas, uh, or perhaps Russia more widely. Um, I don't know, uh, Peter Maddock, Head of Finance, if you have an update for us on that? Yes, yeah, so I can confirm that we don't. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, in general, other Peter, it would be helpful to, uh, sorry, Patrick, it would be helpful to have an action log, uh, perhaps for, for future minutes, just so we can keep track of uh, some of the points uh, that are very well raised. Okay, um, if members are happy, can I see, um, can I see all uh, members in favour of approving the minutes of the 29th of March? Thank you. Any against or any 
abstentions. Very people not here. Yes. Uh, 7th of April, uh, can, I see, uh, can I see some votes in favour of uh, approving the minutes of the 7th of April? Thank you. Any votes against? And some abstentions for not being here. Fantastic. Thank you. I think those are, those are both approved, so I will sign those at the end of the meeting. Uh, turning to the rest of the agenda, we do have to reorder the items, for which um, I apologise, as there's been some late clarification as to the uh, proper procedure for authorising these. Um, so we're actually going to move now to agenda item six, the annual governance statement and local code of governance. I've been advised um, that this needs to be approved in advance of the draft statement of accounts. So we will take agenda item six, and then we will revert to the normal running order uh, for four, five, and onwards. Thank so, you. Good morning. Thank you. So, agenda item six is the annual governance mm -hmm. statement, and we are being asked to approve the annual governance statement. And can I please invite uh, Jonathan Tully, head of internal audit, who's joining on the live stream, to please present this report? Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Um, and thank you for the clarification over uh, accommodating the changes to agenda. Much appreciated. Uh, good morning to all of the committee. I uh, hope you're well. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk you through the annual governance statement reports uh, for today. Um, we're heading to page 151 of your agenda pack. Um, and so just by way of a background, um, it's good to recall that the council and audit regulations require uh, the council to review our governance arrangements uh, annually. And we prepare a document known as the annual governance statements, which are for, as an AGS um, to accompany the statement of accounts. The main purpose of the AGS is to communicate how we're complying with our local code of governance. So I'll explain a little bit about that in the report. So if I can draw your attention to page 153. Um, just highlight, I suppose, that the AGS, it reflects governance matters from the relevant financial year, 2019-2020, plus up to the date when the accounts are signed. So obviously that's quite a long time period. Um, now it's worth reflecting that the previous annual governance statement for 2018-19 was approved with the statement of accounts just recently in March 2022. So consequently, I suppose from that, what I would suggest is that there's not been any significant changes to our governance arrangements uh, in the Council since that time of publication of the previous documents. I think despite that um, period between the two documents, it still provides a good opportunity to, for us to reflect upon things which have happened in the 1920 financial year. Um, we do that through the section called the Review of Effectiveness. Um, in paragraph 14 on the same page, um, I'll just highlight the fact about material changes. Um, it's absolutely right to reflect something significant between the financial year um, and the report dates and when the statement of accounts are signed. So, for example, what we'll see in this year's annual governance statement is the impact of coronavirus. So although that really started to happen in the sort of 2020-21, uh, financial year and its full impact, it's absolutely right to reflect it in this annual governance statement. So the AGS is actually, it's on pages 83 to 95 of your agenda packs. Um, as the statement of accounts includes the annual governance statement, we wanted to try and help our, help the environment and not print off paper unnecessarily. So hopefully you've been able to find that in there. But what we do is we have a separate agenda item for the annual governance statements because they do need to be approved in advance of the statement of accounts. That's a legislative requirement. So that helps just draw attention to that matter. So with your approval, we're going to be able to progress the documents. Um, it will then go through the statement of accounts process of being reviewed by the external auditors. Um, should something materialise, hopefully it won't, but by the external auditors, we would want to go back and just update the uh, annual governance statement. Of course, we'd inform the committee of that. Um, also on page 153, um, I refer to the local code of governance because the purpose of the AGS is to review the local code of governance, and that's on page 155 of your packs. Um, I'd like to apologise actually because I submitted it with track changes, so 
those of you that seen the previous version could quickly see see the changes. Um, but unfortunately, when it went through the uh, report printing process, the track changes were removed. Um, so I'm happy to circulate a version uh, if anyone wants to see that, but there aren't that many, so I can simply talk through them. Um, on page 160, um, we update basically a definition name. Um, the Joint Development Control Committee changed to a Joint Planning Committee, so nothing significant changed there. On page 162, um, we have an equality scheme, and that's been reviewed and updated. So the time period has changed from 2015 to 2020 to 2020 to 24. Um, on page 164, one of the documents that features is um, to do with efficiency. We used to refer to it as efficiency program, but now it's a transformation program. So again, just a name change. And then finally, on page 165, uh, where we used to have uh, what was called an executive management team, we now have a leadership team. So again, just a small name change. So nothing really significant there, but I'm happy to, to share that change, uh, track change version. If anyone does require it, please let me know. And the final thing, which is, I suppose, new on the uh, Code of Governance is on page 173. That's the seven principles of public life, which was something that I introduced to our Code of Governance a few years ago. And a lot of councils are doing that now as best practice um, because it applies to anyone that works in the public sector. Um, just to note really there that under the seven principles, the supporting narrative to explain them, that was changed and updated by um, the actual committee that looks at the principles of public life. So we've just reflected and updated that accordingly, but the, the principles are still the same. Um, so sorry to, to uh, throw you around the agenda pack, but going back to the annual governance statement itself, that starts on page 83 of your packs. The things which I would like to highlight and draw out for your attention on this uh, are, I suppose, briefly, the roles and responsibilities, um, that's a section which talks about how the governance uh, arrangements of the council are structured. So we see different committees detailed there and no major change to previous years, but we did have changes to the senior leadership team um, in that period. So we reflected that in the report. On page 87, and I sort of mentioned this in the, in the covering introduction, um, we include a section about the impact of coronavirus. Um, it's absolutely right to, to include that there and sort of provide some assurances about how we're responding and, and dealing with that, because it did have a big impact on our governance arrangements. On page 91, um, this is our review of effectiveness. So this is our opportunity to look back at how we've complied with our code of governance during the year. And what we would typically include in here are sort of one-off events. If there are things which happen regularly, that's something that features in our code of governance itself. Um, but um, if it's something which has happened particularly in that financial year, then we, we draw attention to it here. And what I like to do, I like to categorize it by the seven different principles. So that really helps draw attention to how we're delivering each of those principles. And it's also it's a good gap analysis in, in any one of them. So that's a really good way of structuring it. Um, on page 93, um, we have our opportunities for improvements. So again, just bear in mind that it's not long since our, our previous annual governance statement. We do refer, we have an action plan update in the document as well. But the, the three things that we've identified to, to work on are capacity for decision making, um, resources too, and of course, these have both been um, extremely affected by external events such as the pandemic. And the third final one there is the financial reporting and our sort of action plan for getting back on track uh, with approving the statement of accounts. The final part of the AGS is the conclusion. Um, so following the uh, external audit review, um, what we do is we sign the AGS as best practice just to sort of demonstrate our commitment to uh, uh, good governance. So just by way of summary, uh, coming back to my reports. Um, so just for clarity, members, you have to approve the annual governance statement in advance of the statement of accounts. Um, the previous annual governance statement for the previous financial year has only just been approved. So not a huge amount of change, but we have reflected 1920 uh, matters. And uh, yeah, it's in the in the statement of accounts. So that's probably all I wanted to do to talk through. I'm happy to take comments or questions. 
Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, you wanted to speak. Thank you, Chair. Through yourself, um, I, you haven't um, made any significant changes, officers, to the report uh, from when we saw it before. So I have no, I have no qualms with us um, endorsing it. Um, I am a fan of track changes, and um, actually, they were because I think Jonathan's nodding because I've raised that before. So if we could please find out why what happened happened because uh, they're really very minutia points that have been changed so um, for the uh, for the future planning chair if you could try and iron out these IT issues that have removed the track changes that I'm ever so fond of thank you very much um, it, I mean it strikes me for an evolving document like the local code of governance it might be appropriate to have a kind of um, change management kind of cover sheet for it that says, you know, this version is version, you know, X point Y. These are the things that have changed since the previous version. I appreciate it's a continually evolving document, but that would help us uh, kind of uh, stay on top of it. Um, are there any other members of the committee that would like to ask any questions, either about the report uh, halfway through the pack or the annual governance statement at the back of the draft statement of accounts? Uh, Councillor Hales, thank you. Just a, just a silly little thing. <clears throat> I'll kind of um, indicate to Peter on page 94 of our pack, um, where you've got the governance um, chart. It, it's obviously self explanatory, the capacity for making decisions, etc., and then the, the explanation. But the responsible officers column is far too close to the actual paragraph. And if you actually read it, you miss out one small word of A or of. It looks like it's a sentence. So I'm just wondering whether we could move that, because it completely changes that context uh, of that paragraph. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I had one or two very uh, brief questions. Um, so obviously the, uh, the action plan presented, or so the opportunities for improvement presented on pages 93 and 94, um, there's only three items there. Will the items from the uh, 1819 AGS be carrying forward as well? So there's, you know, review of the constitution, same with the count, all the, you know, the kind of the eight or nine points that you raised there, are those carrying on as well into the next annual governance statement? Um, that, that's right, yeah, um, because we only just agreed them recently. Um, you know, what I keep in, in the background with all my compiling documents for the, for the annual governance statement is a sort of a workbook of all these actions. So, yeah, where they're, they're still in progress. Um, we'll see a feature about how they've been progressed in, in our next AGS as well. Uh, thank you. Um, on page um, 91, in the, the start of the review of effectiveness, you say that the, the council has a, has a positive risk appetite. Could you just define what you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's so risk appetite is. Um, I'll just start with the basics. So risk appetite is how prepared we are to take risks. So you could have a, a very very strong risk appetite, which could be perhaps a little bit reckless, or you could have a risk averse appetite, where you're frightened to take any risks. Um, the right healthy place to be is sort of just beyond the middle by having a positive risk appetite where we are prepared to take on those challenges and risks. We need to be able to think agilely, be transformative and think commercially in some aspects. Um, so it does, mean, it does mean that it's managed. It's not completely reckless, but it is positive to, to actually have a risk appetite and be prepared to take on those challenges. Uh, thank you. Um, Turning back just to page 89, um, just one or two of the points on the action plan from the, uh, the previous AGS. Um, on the section on control accounts, um, it says that management now have processes in place for monitoring the reconciliations and that processes will be reviewed to um, perhaps simplify the process. Um, can perhaps either, either yourself or, or Peter Maddock talk a little bit as to what that work is, um, why it's taking place and where we've got to with it? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to start off and then Peter can come in as well, it's probably a, a joint double act. Um, you know, what, where we were, I suppose, a couple of years ago um, is that the control accounts weren't being done regularly at the time, so we identified that as an opportunity uh, improvement. It was something picked up by the external auditors as well. We've had various different changes. We've implemented a new financial management system. 
Um, so it was just a great opportunity to make sure that all those processes were more robust. Yes, if I can just add to that. Um, certainly over the last year, uh, we've done a lot of work looking at our reconciliation processes. I think it's fair to say some of them were quite clunky, if that's the right word. So we're looking to streamline the processes that we, we have, make better use of technology, um, and um, just make sure that we do them in a timely fashion. Um, and, you know, set clear targets for when each reconciliation needs to be complete. I think that was a little bit too fluid in the past. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Councillor Helen, do you want to come in? Hi. Um, I have a different question, um, which is on page, which is due with um, the digital strategy on page 88. Um, it kind of ties in a little bit with the control accounts as well. So I can see that the council has launched um, a new self-service portal in this period. And I wondered what work was done to ensure that this integrated well with the council's existing systems, whether there were control accounts or um, additional um, internal audit work to, to ensure that this um, new project integrated well with the other financial systems. I'm happy to take that question. Um, so it actually uh, it is something on my long term uh, audit plan to do some work in that area, ex exactly as you suggested, to, to consider how well it's embedded uh, and integrated and whether there'll be any further opportunities to improve upon that. So um, I haven't done anything at the moment, but it is on our forward plan. Thank you. Thank you. We can perhaps come back to that when we talk about the uh, internal audit plan later in the meeting. Um, is there anyone else who wants to come in on the annual governance statement? Uh, Councillor Jeff Arthurson. Um, yes, I, I, I'm just looking at um, page 94 and um, we're citing, uh, for example, the impact of COVID-19, um, ongoing effects of Brexit, etc. And I was thinking, well, um, if, if one's going to include those as, I suppose, um, risks, um, really we should perhaps also include what appears to be the end of a, a long period of global stability. And we've got very likely an upcoming, well, we have got a cost of living crisis, but it's going to get worse this winter. And I just wondered if that was, um, yeah, given that we've mentioned Brexit and COVID-19, that seems to be on a, a similar, if not a greater level of um, concern. Again, happy to take that. Um... Yeah, it, it, this fun enough, it was something that I was reflecting on uh, this morning, actually, fun enough. Um, when um, we sort of uh, prepare these documents, we do have to think about significant events. And it probably wouldn't come as a surprise. I'm part of a professional network. I, I, I liaise with SIP and things like that. And we have training and meetings to discuss these sort of things and what should be reflected. And I think the thoughts were at the time that under sort of significant issues, um, the, these didn't fall into that category as yet but uh, you know I am beginning to reflect upon that um, around whether it, it does have definitely have a big impact upon our resources um, as we divert resources to assist uh, with these uh, these challenges so I think where I sit at the moment probably where I feel is that it, probably not to include in this document but it would be appropriate to perhaps include in the next annual governance statement but it's, it's definitely a very good consideration, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Richard Stoutbart, sorry, you wanted to speak. So um, there was a mention um, just a few moments ago of the, of the term agility uh, in respect of, um, I mean, the governance process, and I expect in particular with reaching decisions so I think you were suggesting, Jonathan, that um, recent experience has um, perhaps informed the need for agility, but also some of the solutions. Um, could you comment on the notion of agility and you know, how, it, how it's being achieved and where it's appropriate? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's probably quite a broad topic. Um, I, some good examples I suppose to draw upon in, in the context of the annual governance statement would be how we responded to the COVID pandemic 
Um, you know, we really had to move at pace in the way that we worked. Um, we could see that in terms of governance arrangements through the way that um, we had public meetings and how that had to adjust, uh, how we brought in hybrid working, um, how that uh, affected our employees and colleagues as well, how we worked. Um, fortunately, we were quite lucky in that we did have some good ICT infrastructure set up, which enabled us to work remotely. So at a very fundamental level in terms of our capacity and capability, we had to be agile and work differently. And I think looking back personally, um, my, my opinion is that we actually coped reasonably well with that in, in the scope of that challenge. Um, we did continue to do a lot of key business, but also a lot of the work which came around that with things like uh, the, the risk management of trying to respond to the crisis um, and then delivering things at pace um like the business grants um so there's obviously a lot of internal control and risk impacts to that a lot of uh, sort of stakeholder engagement and, and customer focus so i think those are some really good examples of how we've had to be agile and rapidly respond to these sort of external factors so i would just ask a follow-up so in the future if we were to say well Things have been quite stable for a time, but we want to check how agile we are. Um, is there a um, kind of scenario, a set of tests that we might apply um, to the governance process that would check it out? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Probably not one that I have got an immediate answer to. Um, I mean, we we have various different. You can look at it from two different lenses, perhaps. Um, in terms of business continuity, I mean, we do have opportunity to test plans and things like that. So we do that. But I feel maybe it even goes even broader, doesn't it? When you're thinking about agile working, um, it's trying to almost predict and do a little bit of horizon scanning what's going to come over the radar as well. Um, so and we do, we do kind of pick up that as part of the governance process. We try and think about what you know emerging legislation might be and, and emerging risks. but. Whether there's a good test for it or not, that'll probably be something I have to go away and have a think about. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jones. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Jonathan, um, I, I, I don't wish to be rude or anything like that, but I'd kind of like to take issue with the, uh, the word reasonably um, when it regards to uh, the COVID, the response that the council had with COVID. Um, I think we use the word agility. I'd like to compare the council to a gazelle, actually, with uh, regards to its agility, because it felt like it was days, if not perhaps a week, when we were, in my humble opinion, running at full, full capacity when it came to responses from the council, the advice coming out from council, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wonder whether that part could be emphasised because this was an example of our council working at 150% of its normal daily work, if you like, to deliver something to protect hundreds of thousands of people. I, I, can't, I can't give you the words without bursting into tears, frankly, because it was such an emotive process. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, Councillor Williams, thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, for letting me come in there. I think, and I, Jonathan will shake or nod his head, that the term reasonable is, is a tech, you've been using the technical um, of reasonable assurance and everything else. But I would associate myself with the comments that officers did work incredibly hard to divert uh, resources and get us up and running as quickly as they could. So very much um, my, my views are alongside Councillor Hales on that one. I think we, it's just it's a technical um, but, uh, but for the record, I think we all agree with you. Thank you. I mean, we could perhaps look to uh, strengthen some of the language there around the council's COVID response, um, but I'll, I'll leave that perhaps with, uh, with Jonathan to take away. Unless there's anyone else who wants to come in, I'm going to move to recommendations. So we have been asked to um, approve the annual governance statement for 2019-20. Peter, are you happy to second that? Yeah, all yeah. agreed. Okay, by information, thank you very much. That concludes agenda item six. We now revert to the normal course of business with agenda item four. 
So this is the uh, draft statement of accounts for 2019-20. Uh, the committee is asked to uh, review the draft statement of accounts and comment. We're asked to note that the audit is ongoing, the timescales for completion, and the timetable for getting the remaining accounts and audit up to date. I've also been asked to uh, move a new recommendation, uh, which I will do after we've discussed it, um, which is to approve the draft statement of accounts 1920 for audit. I hope nobody uh, objects to me uh, moving that at this late stage. I'm sorry that the papers uh, weren't completely clear on that front. So I'd now like to ask uh, the Head of Finance, uh, Peter Maddock, to present uh, the report and the attached statement of accounts. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, so the statement of accounts itself starts on page 13. Uh, and as I talk about the, uh, the accounts, I'll refer to the big page numbers rather than the little ones in the corner. Um, so, presented here are the draft statement of accounts for the year 2019-20. Um, and um, I'll just quickly pick one or two highlights out from the accounts, if that's okay. Um, so, if we turn to page 24. So, um, 24 and the following three pages contain what we call the core statements, so all local authorities will have these statements within their accounts. So the first one is called the Comprehensive Income and Expenditure Statement. And this reports the activity for the year in terms of our income and expenditure. Um, one thing you will notice uh, within that statement, we report a deficit of 1.189 million. Um, just to clarify that in a little bit more detail, that doesn't mean to say that we made a deficit overall because you have to take the statement on page 24 and the statement on page 25 to fully appreciate the performance of both our general fund and our housing revenue account. So if we take the general fund, for example, um, you'll see that the actual um, performance of the general fund which is the second row up on page 25, was a surplus of 318,000. So that was the overall performance of the general fund. So the, the statement called movement in reserve statement, which we refer to sometimes, refer to sometimes as the MERS, that statement um, contains all of the adjusting items that we have to put in to bring us back to the amount that we can charge against the council tax or housing rents, depending on whether it's um, general fund or housing revenue account. So, for example, in the comprehensive income and expenditure statement, we have to account for depreciation uh, in relation to our assets, and that's in line with proper accounting practice. However, we are not able to charge that against the council tax. So in the movement in, reserves, the movement in reserve statement, we have to remove that charge. And there were a number of other items like that. So on, if we move on to page 26, we have the balance sheet. And uh, it, it's a statement of what we own and what we own. So again, I'll, I'll pick up a few highlights there. For example, the, the largest item on that is our property, plant and equipment at £550 million. And the biggest element within that will be our council dwellings. Uh, and these are valued based on existing use with tenants in occupation. And you'll see that's increased in value by some £41 million. We have professional valuers that will look at our housing stock and will value it based on, on their expertise. And that will be uh, something that the auditors will be looking at and satisfying themselves whether they've done that correctly or not. For the first time, just below that, we have a line for investment properties of two full 24.6 million. And we bought three such properties during the year. So that's a new item that appears in the balance sheet for the first time. Um, we've also um, reclassified long-term investments and that relates to Ermine Street. We've had the latest business plan and that suggests that the 
loans that we make to them will not be paid off until 2045. So clearly, in real terms, they are long-term investments rather than short-term. Um, the, other, the other item potentially to note is that called the pensions liability. And this is an attempt to, by the actuary, to estimate the value of our, our proportion of the pensions fund. Um, the figures can vary quite significantly. There's a number of assumptions that are used uh, and we're, they're projecting forward over a fairly long period of time. So it, whilst there's a, there's a fairly large figure there for a liability, it's not a liability we're going to have to pay any time soon. And as the years progress, that figure may go up or may go down depending on the performance of the fund and the assumptions used around um, life expectancy and things like that. Uh, and the final core statement is the cash flow statement. Uh, and effectively, that's just looking at our cash, what, what we've spent it on, and it then reconciles our uh, net surplus or deficit on the provision of services to our balance sheet figures for the cash and cash equivalents. Um, after that, between pages uh, 29 and 66, there are a number of notes, and they just give a little bit more detail on some of the figures, either in the CIES balance sheet, etc. Um, some of the notes are quite technical, but um, the, the notes and the format of the notes that are provided within the accounts are governed by the accounting code of practice. So there's a degree of consistency across local authorities. Um, if we then turn to page 67, and that's big number 67, um, you'll see we have our housing revenue account. So not all local authorities have a housing revenue account. We do. We have our own council stock, and we have to account for that separately from our general fund. So there is a separate statement and a number of notes in relation to our housing revenue account. And then on page 73, we have another account called the collection fund. And as a billing authority, we are responsible for collecting the business rates and council tax, not just for ourselves, but for um, the county council, parish councils, fire and police in terms of council tax, and on business rates for ourselves, the county council, the fire authority, and central government. Um, so I don't know whether we pause there and whether we take any questions on the statements or whether you want me to continue with the further update. I think that might be a natural point to just yeah, um, okay. uh, pause and take some questions. Um, I'd just like to say, first of all, um, thank you to you and your team for um, cracking on with this work immediately after the sign-off of the previous accounts. I appreciate you must have worked quite hard to turn this around at speed, and it's obviously important in terms of keeping on track with the audit timetable, so thank you for the work you've put in on that. Um, but yes, does anyone have any questions? I think probably people will. Uh, I'll take uh, Councillor Heather Williams, and then I'll come to you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I have um, three or four questions, so would you like me to take them in turn or, or create a list? Well, if I say them, Chair, then you can decide on their substantiality. All right. Um, so, referring to page 17, uh, big, that's big page 17, it's going to get confusing. So, for all of my references, it will be the, the big numbers. Um, there are obviously a lot of variances. Now, I'm assuming that those variances came in quarter four because of COVID. Um, it's particularly around, because I'm noting the health and environmental services and housing. If I could have some confirmation that I... ...microphone, does it come back in? On, on those. Um, but one figure that I wasn't sure was on the Greater Cambridgeshire City deal, the variance of 18.1. Um, so some uh, commentary as to why, why that was required would be helpful, Chair. Um, page 26... The investment properties, um, this is probably a timing issue, but just from a, a scrutiny point of view, I am aware that when we made the decision as a council to invest in the science park, that was pre-March 2019. So it may be that the transaction took place afterwards, but if we could just clarify, because obviously then there wouldn't be a, um, a blank on the 19. So we could have clarification on, on that, please, Chair. 
Um, and then in relation to page 50 in the notes sections of borrowing and um, short term and, and long term. Now, I appreciate that we are taking advantage and understandably of lower interest rates on short term borrowing, but that will have to be, um, you know, borrowed again and refinanced. What if, if I was looking, and I'm thinking, Chair, from a sort of public um, accessibility situation, if I was looking at these notes, I, I would make the assumption that that was going to be paid off within the 12 months, not for the purpose of refinancing. So I'm wondering um, if it's wise to make reference to that in the notes section somehow, um, that that is the reason that we're doing that or that might be something that we're restricted, as Mr Maddox says, on, on what we can do. But it's just, it may be somewhere else, maybe I've missed it, but it, some sort of um, commentary and uh, assessment of that, because really it is long-term borrowing, we're just doing it on a short-term basis, unless those figures are somewhere else. I, I will leave Mr Maddox to just, I just didn't feel that was clear in the, in the notes, but that may be a very good reason. Ed, thank you. Uh, Peter, do you want to come back on those? So let me see if I can remember this. Uh, well, let me, I'll deal with the um, investment property one first because the first property was purchased in April, so it just slipped into the 1920. So the yeah, so the decision was made. I think really to late March, but then it, it occurred in April. Um, as in, in relation to the Greater Cambridge City deal, I need to check that there. It's off the top of my head. I'm not entirely sure. But it's probably it's probably sensible to make reference to it in there because no, we don't. So yeah, I, I'll need to clarify that. I can't, I can't I can't off the top of my head. So that's a Greater Cambridge City deal. And there's another question on there around was it environmental services? Chairman, and I'm happy to take um, uh, responses after the meeting if that helps yeah, in some of these. I mean, but I could probably was... find out pretty quick. Yeah. Um, it, I just wanted to seek reassurance that the variances for environmental services were due to COVID and not for another reason that we're not aware of. Um, and then it was about the short, long-term uh, treasury management. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I'd, I'd need to, to check on the data like that. Um, as regards the, the uh, treasury management, now the notes are fairly prescriptive what we put in here. Um, and you were referring to sh the fact that we've got quite a bit of short-term borrowing at the moment. We are um, meeting with our Treasury advisors next month to explore whether we uh, move our borrowing longer term. Um, we've taken advantage of, uh, of really quite low rates on short-term borrowing, but we do now see the gap between the rates on short-term and long-term borrowing is closing. Um, so I think we now got to the stage where we need to seriously think about going longer term with our borrowing. Um, I think the meeting's probably the week after next, so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss it with them. My gut feeling is it probably is now the time to, to think seriously about going longer term on our borrowing. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you want to come back in? Thank you. Um, so is it, would it be wise to refer to our strategy in the notes, or is it something that because of the way local government is, we can't uh, make reference to in the notes? I mean, it wasn't particularly relevant to the year in question, if, I, if I'm honest, because this is something that's happened soon. Because at the time, we hadn't got, other than the borrowing we had for the housing revenue account, we hadn't actually got any general fund borrowing at the time. So, it, you know, potentially it would be something we could put in the narrative statement in a later year of the accounts if we felt it was relevant. But I think it, it relates to later years rather than the year in question. If I could put that a request in for 2021 then, please, Chair. Uh, thank you. I think um, just on that point about uh, treasury management, I think if, you're, if we're kind of considering a change in strategic direction, it might be worth bringing an item to the next meeting of this committee in September, if it's not already in, um, to, to update the committee on that following your meeting with the advisors. Yes, yeah, so, so we would normally have at the next meeting, we would normally have a treasury report anyway, so we can include that within that, if that's helpful. Fantastic. Uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey, I think, did you want to come in? Thank you. 
Yes. Um, thank you, Chair. Am I allowed two questions? Well, I will anyway. Um, okay. So, um, first one was I just wanted a bit of um, clarification on um, the uh, comments on the pensions fund. Um, I suppose, um, firstly, it seems a bit of a shame that life expectancy seems to be decreasing, but I, I think that's an actuarial uh, thing rather than anything for us to particularly worry about. But um, is the liability, um, so it's gone from 70 uh, million, is that right? Um, yes, to 57. Uh, is, is that the sort of total liability or is that the liability um, net of what we expect the return on investments held by the county pension uh, administrators to produce? Um, so, so I wonder whether that's kind of that the, the return from the investments is kind of brought, brought in, in in some other way in the accounts, um, and that would be um, subtracted from this total liability. So um, it contains all of those factors. Okay. So it looks at uh, returns on the, the plan assets, any interest that they have to pay, but it, it but it is looking forward quite a long time, and uh, for, for whatever reason. Um, the actuary's view is that um, life expectancy is going down a bit, so they're thinking they're not going to be paying pensions for quite as, lo quite as long as they might have done. Um, but we're, we're actually due uh, our next tri, tri can't say the word, triennial valuation. So every three years, there's a full-scale revaluation of the pension fund, and that's ongoing at the moment. So again, potentially, we, we, we'll see shifts in valuations as a result of that. And every year, as I say, he actually goes through the process. So you can see some reasonably big, big, reasonably big swings because of the assumptions used. And again, um, the, the team at EY will be looking at those assumptions to see whether they're reasonable and forming a view on those. Mm. Um, through you, Chair, can I just follow up on that? So I, I just really wanted clarity on whether that number is our exposure to sort of gross pensions figure or whether it's the, the liability once we deduct the kind of the worst case performance of our investments um, in the pension fund. So it, it's an attempt, it's an attempt to, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, sorry, it, it's an attempt to value now um, the liability over the long term. It takes into account the performance of the pension fund. It takes into account how long we're going to pay pensions for. But as you can appreciate, we're looking a long way in the future, so there's a lot of estimation and assumptions that go, in, go into that. And I, you can guarantee that the figure will move by several million for the 2021 account. Thank you. And may I, Chair, ask a, a further question on page 43? Um, and... I was just looking at some of the um, variation between the figures for 2018-19 versus 19-20, and some of them were quite sort of large figures. Well, obviously, that's probably due to a change in the way the, um, the sort of core data is presented. I mean, for example, um, in the first column, uh, sort of the, the fifth number down, we've got the um, housing revenue account, um, net expenditure chargeable to general fund, and, you know, that's 166,000 in um, 1819 and 6,000, uh, well, 6 million in, um, so I, I would just be puzzled by some of the, because normally expect figures to be slightly similar year to year, even if there are changes. I mean, one of, one of the things that can distort figures in our comprehensive income and expenditure statement are changes in valuations. Okay. So, um, if there's, a, if there's a, a downward valuation or an upward valuation, uh, it, depending on the circumstances, we have to put it through the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I think on the housing revenue account, we've got an increase in surplus. So, if we turn to the page, uh, wherever it was, um, was it 70 or 60 something? So, on that statement, it should give you a bit more information on what that is. So, um, let's have a look. Okay. So there was a, yeah, I mean, it's actually only 2.3 million on here. So there was a revaluation gain 
the 2.3 million, which we didn't have in the previous year. Yeah. Okay. But looking at that statement will we'll give you a little bit more information. Yeah. Okay. I think I okay. understand that. So it's actually kind of what appear to be large variations are actually small variations on a very big number, I'm guessing. So, uh, uh, and some of those value variations can be things like valuations, which again yeah. we reverse out in the movement in reserve statement. So again, they don't impact on yes. on the HRA. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just on that uh, pensions point, before we leave it, if I remember correctly, so after the review is completed, we will then agree with uh, the county council as the pension holder as to what our rates will be for the next few years, depending on where they assess us in kind of surplus deficit. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So as a, as a result of the triangle, oops, triangle um, valuation, um, there will be a pension deficit. Uh, There'll be a pension deficit uh, figure calculated that they will inform us, and we'll need to to build to build that in. Um, uh, and, and yeah, there'll be a number of other things that come out of the final valuation. I, I think the timetable for for knowing those numbers is the autumn. So, and I know they're in the process at the moment of doing that doing that work. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the committee, Councillor Henley? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to focus on a couple of notes, please. Um, note 12A, um, the, the property plant and equipment note, please. Um, it's on page 47. Thank you. So um, I'm just bearing in mind um, the various issues around fixed assets in general. Um, I wanted to ask... Um, about the revaluation figures, the two revaluation notes, um, the amount that's credited to the revaluation reserve and the, um, the revaluation applied to the CIES. Um, they're quite, um, there's, there's 24 on the, the council dwellings, the revaluation, the 24 million pounds, please. Um, I wanted to ask what work is done to underpin that figure based on the, the new financial system? The, the new account, the new asset system. So um, the revaluations that you see there will be um, driven by the valuation report initially. So our valuers will suddenly have valued all our council dwellings. So, yeah, so that line in particular relates to the council dwellings. So they, they, they will have gone through a valuation process. Uh, we, they were valued every year. Um, Every year there's like a desktop valuation, but then every five years there's a full revaluation, which involves actually visiting properties. So there's a, there's a set, set out process there. Um, now, the, so, so you know, we, the, that's where the figures come from. Um, the figures are obviously then checked for reasonableness. The information is then put into our asset register. Um, we have to put all of our figures in in a particular order so that um, the revaluation the revaluation is calculated against the correct figures. So um, that information is put into our asset register and that calculates how much of the revaluation we need to put directly to our revaluation reserve and how much we have to put through our comprehensive income and expenditure statement. So um, one of the reasons uh, for going over to an asset register is it's quite complicated and technical, and to try and do it on spreadsheets is not easy and is prone to error. But if you have a system that um, has all the parameters set on it, up in it, uh, and you, you put the information in the system as it's supposed to be, the system does all the work for you. Uh, and obviously the system is used by a number of authorities, it's been tested uh, and been found to be robust. So we know that it's calculating it in the right way. So, um, yeah, our fixed asset register system will calculate those figures for you. Um, I can go into um, why some goes to the CIS and one goes to the evaluation reserve. It's quite technical, but um, if, you're, if you're happy for me to yes, talk about please. it. Okay. Um, so, um, in two th at the start of the year 2007, um, the revaluation reserve was introduced. So all transactions prior to that date 
were consolidated with what was called, I can't even remember what the other account was called, but they were brought together in to something called the capital adjustment account. So your, your revaluation reserve at that point started at nil. So the value, any increase in value of property after that date, above the valuation you had in 2007, is put to the revaluation reserve. If it goes below the valuation you had in 2007, then that's when you start putting it through the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. Um, if you've gone below the 2007 value and you start to increase your values, again, towards that number, you, put, you reverse the figure first through the comprehensive income and expenditure statement. Then when you reach your 2007 value, you then start putting it into the revaluation reserve. So that, the date of April 2007 is key to all of that. Um, there are other factors you have to take into account, additions that have occurred since. So it's not quite as simple as what I've explained, but broadly, that's what it's looking at, is comparing valuations to that period of time. But it is, you know, I'm happy to talk you through it in more detail if you'd like to. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and a separate point, please. Um, you touched on this in your opening um, narrative. I was interested in the reclassification of, this is note page 49, note 13. Um, this is a significant shift um, between uh, the maturity of investments. Um, what's happened there, please? Can you explain sort of what, what the detail of that is? I can see it's gone from um, uh, 9 million, 9.9 .9 million in, to, in 2019 to 74 million. In 2020. So this is this um, the long-term, short-term reclassification. When you when you look at the oh um, sorry yeah so you touched um, on this it's it's at, if you look at the balance sheet as well on page 26 you can see there's a significant shift on the one two three fourth line down the long-term investments line and it's explored it you know sort of pulled out in this note. Yeah so um, the Urban Street have, have produced their updated business plan. Um, and uh, within that plan, they're not they're not able to pay back the lending that we've um, lent to them in the short term. Um, so um, the plan, which has, has been through committee, is that um, they will be paying us back the lending in in the long term, which is why we've reclassified. So the substance of the transaction, uh, uh, you know, you have to look at the substance or or the form of the transaction. The uh, the uh, you know, it's pretty clear now that, um, you know, they're not in a position to repay that uh, until that time. But equally, it, it, you know, um, as members will be aware, it's been a, a, a good investment, I believe, by the council, providing a really good return to support services. So, uh, you know, there's no, we have no concern there. The, the, the assets that Urban Street hold are property assets. Um, so that there's no real concern around the fact that the money's not coming back in the short term. Um, would it be worth perhaps putting a note that it was to do with the Ermin Street investment here so that it's more um, comprehensible to, about what the change is? I don't know whether you uh, want to add that. But it's an extra sentence to explain it's to do with this reclassification in the business plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jess Hales, you wanted to come in? Thank you. Yeah, it's um, just a point of clarification, if I may, through you, Chair. So I think you said the uh, pension fund is held by Cambridge County Council. Um, that was news to me, so there you go. Um, it, this isn't something that necessarily needs to be discussed today, but I was just wondering if, if I could come through Peter and ask that if he could provide a kind of a, a short potted history, if you like, about the pension fund itself and as to its strength, weaknesses, um, I don't want a Robert Maxwell uh, situation, if you get my drift, uh, and what have you. So we, we need to make sure that that's um, as robust as it may well be. And, our, and if there are any risks associated with our pension scheme being held by county, rather than holding it ourselves, so to speak, um, can you 
give me some thoughts on that as well. But that would be for something that you to at, at your leisure, perhaps. Thanks. Thank you. Any further input from members of the committee? Uh, Helen, you want to come back in? Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. It's a general point, actually, rather than uh, going into the details of the notes, and it's slightly touched back um, on the earlier point in the agenda. I've just gone back to page 88, which is one of the, um, the annual government statement comments. I wanted to just check. Um, it's the, the middle paragraph talking about uh, the process, the challenging process of preparing these accounts. I just wanted to ask how it was going as a sort of general point. Um, how, how are you managing this challenging um, time scale? And it talks about close management being required. I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what, what you're actually doing to manage this process for this year's accounts, or this, this set of accounts. Um, I, was, oh, sorry. Yeah, problem. Um, I was going to go on to the, the talk about that uh, once we finish with the statement of accounts, so I'm happy to pick that up as part of that, if that's OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a, a few uh, very uh, brief points from me. Um, on page 21, um, I would like to be chair rather than chairman, if that's not too much to ask. Um, yeah. In, uh, on page 45, um, it strikes me that um, that's quite a lot of separate reserves accounts that are broken out on that page. And I think there are probably, I'm not even sure that's, I'm not even sure that's, that's necessarily all of the different pots of reserves that are held by the council. Um, do you think it would be worth, at some point, this committee um, reviewing? I mean, it's no point looking at it on a historical basis, but looking at the kind of present value of our reserves and are they being used for the kind of best benefit of the council and that there aren't bits of money that have been, um, you know, put aside and, and, and forgotten about, dare I say? So, um, as part of our budget process, we do review our reserves. I think a couple of years ago, we did quite a detailed review. Um, and, and then every year we would we would review them. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to uh, do a more detailed review if, if that's felt necessary. I think there probably is some merit merit in it. We do hold substantial reserves, and it's always good practice to either check whether they're adequate or, in fact, whether we actually still need them. So, um, yeah, more than happy to do that. Thank you. Would that be interest to the committee. Sorry, lots of hands gone up here. Councillor Williams, and I'll come to you, Richard. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, your, your principles are sound on that one. Um, I would just stress that our job is to scrutinise the, the audit and governance arrangements. On the way that money is used, that is the responsibility of Cabinet and a political function. This committee is not a political function. It's a, a scrutiny of the executive. So, I have nothing uh, against your, your drive and ambition to look at it, but I do wonder if it is appropriate. I mean, that's something that we do through the budget setting process as for council. Um, it w all I'd say is it wouldn't affect me as much as it would perhaps affect the others in the room if we were to tread on the toes of cabinet. Thank you. That's a, that's a fair point. I suppose there's a sort of, there's a slight kind of grey area when it comes to kind of classification of reserves and if things are being kind of appropriately kind of earmarked. Um, but I agree that we shouldn't kind of step into the budgeting process. And uh, perhaps we can come back to that suggestion offline and see if there's a role for uh, this committee to provide some support there. Um, sorry, did, sorry, uh, Richard, do you want to come in on, on this as well? Sorry. Um, and at risk of going off on a complete tangent, I mean, we were talking about valuations. Um, and, of course, this is a changing scene. If you were to, uh, you know, conduct a, a major program of perhaps energy improvement um, in regard to the, you know, the housing stock, that could result in a significant change in valuation. I, I was just interested in how valuation influences perhaps project decisions about do we do this or do we do that uh, in terms of uh, its effect on the balance sheet, if you will. I think I'd be, I'd be quite cautious about using the balance sheet value issue, particularly of our council values, for any of those sort of decisions. Um, there's a prescribed way of valuing those, um, and they're valued on the basis of the sitting tenant. And for this part of the country, the factor is 38% of its open market value. 
Now, um, that's a, a set down percentage. Uh, and obviously, using the values in the balance sheet, I think, would not be appropriate. But clearly, you know, valuation can have, you know, can have some part to play in those sort of decisions. If I can, just on that topic, I mean, my view very much on revaluation is it's something that us as accountants spend a lot of time on, um, dotting I's, crossing T's, but it has no cash reality. The only reason that it would come into um, a decision-making process, I think, for investment purposes is if we were looking to sell off um, sell off an asset, because it's a bit like with your, with your house, you know, you buy a house, I think we've all Apart from me, I don't own a house, but most people buy a house and see the, um, the increase happen of their property. But it's only really of any um, effect if you're planning to downsize because then you can release the capital. The reality is your house has gone up and so have all the other houses around you. And therefore, it's all relative. Um, and actually, the fact that your house is worth more than what you bought it for is just simply on paper. It doesn't affect your quality of life or your decision making processes until certain events occur. So I don't know if that helps, uh, Chair. Thank you, no, that's, that's very helpful. Um, if I could also add, um, uh, if you go to page 69, um, it actually tells you there what the vacant possession value is of our council dwellings. And it's 1.289 billion. So for, you know, it's, it's a huge difference to what we, we put in the value sheet. So if we didn't have any tenants uh, in any of our council dwellings, we could uh, get a lot more money for them. So, um, and the reality is, we have we have to value our, our dwellings based on their existing use because obviously they have tenants in. So I, I think that's quite an interesting thing to, to note. <laughs> no, well, I think we can all be very glad that the housing stock is being put to the use it's being put to. Um, but uh, it's, an, it's, it's an interesting point, Peter. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up quickly um, on the cash and cash equivalents on page 51. Um, we've got, um, this is a kind of treasury management point again, really. Um, we're listing kind of bank overdrafts of somewhere north of a million, despite obviously having um, significant uh, deposits. Can I, what's the kind of rationale of those kind of interest-free or sufficiently interest low that it makes sense to carry on holding overdrafts in that situation? Um. I probably need to do a little bit, uh, have a look at that, because... Um, I mean, obviously, it would be, the, it would be the, the present value of overdrafts that would be of interest, rather so, than... Um, yeah, so we do have a number of, of short-term investments, uh, and obviously there was 19 million in those. Um, I probably need to take that one away. Yeah, second. I think maybe maybe if we can include that when we're updating on Treasury Management, you know, what's the level of overdrafts, what interest are we paying on it, and, and so, therefore, what's the rationale for it when we're kind of relatively current asset rich to still be holding... Um, still be holding those. Um, if I may, I'd just like to make uh, make just one or two general points. Um, this is not so much for uh, this version. Obviously, I think we all appreciate this as sort of need for speed at the moment in terms of um, getting these uh, accounts accurately uh, compiled and presented and audited um, and then, you know, and out into the public domain. Um, but in, in more general terms, this should be a kind of key document that the council produces. Um, I sort of go backwards and forwards as to how much people will actually look at a document like this. But um, I, it is the sort of thing I think that people might look at, um, either the general public because they're interested in how their money's being spent, uh, a, you know, a business might look at it when deciding whether or not to do, uh, to kind of enter into contracts with us. Uh, potential employees might look at it if they want to kind of get a sense of, you know, is this an organization that I want to kind of um, hitch my career to? Um, and, and so in that context, I wonder if um, we can do some more work, just even just on the kind of the visual presentation of, of these reports in the future. Um, I think, you know, this is a, you know, I mean, my experience in my sort of short time to date has been that this is a very, you know, modern professional council. Um, and I think we want that brand to speak through a, a key document such as this. Um, and I think also in the, so that's a sort of, you know, graphic design, dare I say, issue. Um, in terms of, obviously, a lot of this is prescribed, uh, as you say, by the accounting standards. But when it comes to the, the narrative report, obviously, we've got more uh, freedom there in terms of, in terms of what we say. And, and I wonder there, again, if we can do some more work thinking about you know, what are the key questions that people are going to have 
when they come to look at this document and are we really answering them in the narrative report? I mean, you know, things that would occur to me are, you know, um, is, the, is the council uh, collecting enough in council tax rates and grants to meet its kind of core business needs? Um, is, the, you know, is the council's portfolio of council houses, um, is that, you know, do, you know what, is there a surplus, is there a deficit on that? Is the council being able to reinvest in that? Um, you know, and perhaps maybe, you know, what kind of, you know, what's the, uh, what's the kind of state of the council's balance sheet and how is it managing its money? And I think at the moment the narrative, you know, there's, there's a lot of good stuff in the, in the narrative section, but I do slightly get the sense that it's, it's slightly accountants speaking to accountants, which in this present exalted company is all well and good. Um, but I, I wonder if we can just really tighten up how we approach those sections. Um, happy, if you want to come in on that. Uh, yeah. So um, it's an inter interesting point you make about uh, the accounts. Uh, and that They are done basically in Excel, um, but we are intending for 2020, or we're hoping for 2021, and that's certainly my intention, to produce these in some form of a Word document. And, and you're right, it, you know, it will look uh, a bit more professional. It will give us the ability, because one, one of the issues we do have, and you, you may have noticed, some of the tables are quite small, um, and uh, it would probably be better to put them in landscape, just, just so it's a bit easier to read. Um, so um, we are thinking that for 2021, we will do the accounts differently. Uh, we get to look at that in, in a huge amount of detail. We've started thinking about it, but over the next few weeks, we'll start to kick that process off. Um, as regards the narrative report, yes, I, I would probably agree. I mean, um, a, a number of years ago, there was talk about um, using a narrative uh, statement to tell the story, or, uh, you know, and tell the story of the authority. So there probably is some merit in, in making it a bit more user-friendly and telling the story of the local authority rather than being... Uh, uh, and yeah, it's probably a fair, fair point. It's a bit accountancy speak, and we can probably do a bit more on that. I mean, and, I mean, sort of, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is that, you know, if I want to know, um, you know what's the surplus or deficit on a particular fund now because of the accountancy regulations, if you look in three different places, you'll probably get three different, three different numbers for that. And so trying to, you know, even just sort of for my own benefit, trying to figure out, okay, so what is the surplus or deficit on the household revenue account, for instance, is not kind of immediately, you know, I said I can find sort of several possible numbers. And I think I've now found myself the note that links all of those together. Um, so, you know, I'm happy that it's all correct. But, um, you know, I think it's those sorts of things that uh, we can tighten up. But anyway, I mean, but I, but I absolutely appreciate, you know, that the focus at the moment is on um, the accuracy of the numbers and giving these, because obviously there's, there's no point trying to present a, a sort of professional view if we're not actually even up to date with our accounts. That's obviously priority one. So, um, yeah. so uh, thank you very much for Yeah, and there, there is sort of some things that, uh, you know, need to be in the narrative statement. We do have a degree of freedom about some of these things. Thank you. Are there any further comments before I move to the recommendations? No. Well, thank you all. It's, uh, it's a real privilege for me to be in a room of such expertise as I am now. And, um, and I hope... Uh, I hope, uh, I hope, I hope Peter and, uh, and and Liz feel the same. Sorry, Peter. It was sorry. Did you want to talk further about some of the other? I, I was just going to say a little bit about the the, the forward program, if that's okay. Uh, yes, so, yes, please do. That's very important. Sort of, yeah. So, um, so there's a little bit of commentary on the 2019-20 audit of accounts, which uh, started on the 13th of June. Um, we weren't able to present the statement of accounts at that time, but our, our colleagues in EY were able to at least make a start and carry out some of the work that, uh, that they need to carry out. We have now provided the uh, draft statement of accounts, so that will enable them to do further work. Um, we think the audit is potentially going to go uh, be completed either at the end of October or it might possibly slip into November, but we can't be certain of that because it does depend on what comes out of the audit. Uh, for 2021, um, we have started to look at that process already. We have a dedicated resource that's looking at that year in particular. We're intending to use our finance system uh, a bit better uh, so that we can get information direct from that system rather than use um, slightly clunky uh, Excel spreadsheets, etc. So there is an intention not only to use our finance system a bit better, but also to, to hopefully produce a statement of accounts that does indeed look a little bit better than potentially in Word. Um, and then for 21, 22 and later years, 
uh, the intention would be to do the accounts and audit those during the 23-24 financial year. But again, we can't be sure exactly on the timing because it's dependent on the years before that. Um, I've forgotten your question. I was just asking how it was going and um, um, yeah. you, know, you, you sort of mentioned that it was a challenging process and that close management would be yeah. required, but you, you've elaborated. Yeah, so I, I, I think I would say 1920, I think it's gone reasonably well. Obviously, our colleagues from EY can comment on that as part of their report. But um, I do feel it's gone better than past years. Um, but I, I'm sure there's still room for improvement, which hopefully we can do as the years progress. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams, I think you indicated you wanted to speak on that. Yes, thank you, Chair. It was um, just in relation to, obviously, we've, we've got the timetable here, but we did have a full council meeting on the 18th of October, and there was a, a resolution from that of when we'd be caught up, and I don't think we're going to quite meet that. So I'm wondering whether it would be wise um, for because it was for the accounts to be up to date by October 22. And that was all the accounts. So we're not there for, for whatever reason. But I do wonder whether it is wise that given that we made that um, commitment and we voted on it um, and that it went through, that we need to update all members in a, in a briefing note or something to um, explain and keep them informed because obviously this is... For whatever reasons, it's not matching what we committed to back then. And I know this, you know, we've known from COVID things get in the way, but um, I do think it would be wise to, to clarify that for the broader council membership. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. That's, um, that's really helpful to know. Um, uh, perhaps, um, Patrick, do you think you could get me a copy of that, um, of that resolution uh, just for my own records? Um, and yeah, we'll consider what the best way is to update uh, update all members and uh, yeah, I'm aware that this is a this is obviously of interest uh, to the wider council and the public so um, so thank you it's good to it's good to make clear thank you any further comments on the timetable I think we're happy uh, well I'm going to move the recommendation to this item and then we're going to come on to the audit plan if that's all right so um, the recommendations are stated in your packs are on page seven, which are that the committee review the draft statement of accounts for 1920 and comment as appropriate. I think we've uh, definitely done that. Um, and that we note the uh, 1920 uh, audit uh, timetables and the proposed timetables for the remaining accounts and audits up to date. And I've been asked to add a new recommendation that we approve the draft statement of accounts uh, for the audit. Uh, or words very similar to that, which Peter will confirm to Patrick, and we can check in the minutes. Um, are those? Are you, are you happy with those words? Yeah. Chair, we have to know what we're voting on. We I think. I think. Sorry, as I just said, so that the committee approves the draft statement of accounts for 1920 for the audit. Nope. I think we're happy with that. Okay. Um, Peter, are you happy? Happy to second those. I can second. Okay, uh, does anyone object to those recommendations? Any abstentions? No, okay, I think, I think those are affirmed. Thank you very much. So that was uh, one of the uh, big substantial items of the day. Thank you all very much for your input there. Um, we're going to turn now to uh, agenda item five, which is the uh, external audit plan. Um, and we are being asked to note this report. Um, I believe we have some representatives from Ernst Young on the call. Uh, so could I please ask uh, Janet Dawson from Ernst Young to please present this report. Thanks very much, Chair, um, and good morning, um, committee. A, a quick introduction, I think, would be helpful for those of you who are new to the committee. So I'm Janet Dawson. I'm the partner um, at Ernst Young, um, and I lead the audit and provide the opinion on behalf of the firm. Um, on the statements of accounts and also on your value for money arrangements. Um, and if I can introduce my colleague, Mark Russell, who is the senior manager who um, runs the uh, manages the audit, runs the team and, and leads on a lot of the day to day um, linkage back to Peter and his team um, to deliver the audits. 
So you've got in your pack um, the audit strategy for the work that we believe we need to undertake to be able to provide an opinion on the financial statements for 1920. And if I take you to the executive summary, which starts on page 111 of your large numbers, um, where we start to set out the key risks as we see it in terms of the work that we need to do. And um, I'm conscious that uh, there's lots of reference to esteemed um, colleagues who are accountants. So I'm hoping that you'll, you'll feel fairly familiar with the world of audit. But let me just take you through what those uh, risks mean and then the work that we do in relation to those. So you'll see the first two are to do with misstatements due to fraud or error um, and uh, a specific a aspect around um, within local government, the ability to manipulate the position by inappropriate capitalisation of revenue expenditure. Now, that these are, um, we as auditors are required to consider the risk of fraud or error in every audit that we do. And within local government, that's typically where you'll find it manifest within the uh, plan. So um, hopefully you're not concerned that we think that there is a great risk of fraud and error across your organisation we are required to do this under the international standards of auditing. We then go on to capital accounting entries and you'll be aware from the history of um, the last two audits that the council has really struggled in terms of records and the implementation of a new fixed asset register in previous years and that's one of the significant areas of difficulty that we've had in audits in the past. Um, so we've put this as a significant risk we are hopeful that the work that we had done with the council last year for the 1819 accounts um, puts us all in a very strong position. However, we do need to make sure that we are sceptical, that we have additional procedures planned to ensure that we have ad fully addressed the risk that there, there are still issues within that system um, that would affect the reporting in 1920. The next risk that we've identified there is around valuation of investment properties, and there's already been some discussion about those in that they're new this year. Um, the reason that we've got that as a significant risk is obviously the basis of valuation for those is different from your property plant and equipment that you've reported in previous years. Now, actually, it is three properties where um, hoping that the valuation process will be relatively straightforward. However, they are a significant number and it is a different basis of valuation this year for those. And therefore, um, we will be required to do some additional and different procedures um, to get assurance over those, those numbers. If I take you on to the next page, um, we've included the uh, non-domestic rate appeals provision. And the reason that this has um, resulted in a higher risk rating than in previous years is because you've changed your specialist who is supporting you in deriving that number um, in this year. And therefore, we need to understand how the, the specialist goes about their work, what their methodology is, what their qualifications are, um, to then determine whether or not um, that provision has been derived appropriately. And it sits at a um, in the previous year at 3.5 million, which is material, and we'll come on to the levels of material materiality that we use, um, but that is a material number in the accounts, hence it's um, elevation to um, inherent risk. You'll be pleased to note that the next risk has come down from significant risk to inherent risk, and that is um, to do with the presentation and disclosure of accounting items. And this really reflects what Peter has been talking about in terms of dedicated resource, a focus on getting the 2019-20 accounts in a good shape for the audit, um, and the level of quality assurance that's gone into producing those accounts and then the working papers to support them. So we believe that actually all of that um, positive effort will allow us to reduce the um, focus on uh, the presentation and disclosure of accounting items and bring it down you know, out of our top risk rating to inherent risk. The next two are um, risks that we would look at due to the significance of the numbers in your accounts. And again, we've talked about those already in the committee. So valuation of other land and buildings um, and the, the number that's included in your accounts there and your reliance on the specialist to derive that number. And similarly, the pension liability valuation and the, you know, the level of complexity and assumption that goes into to deriving that and the reliance on actuaries. So again, we have those at a higher inherent risk level. And then the final two, which are on page 113, are around the group accounts which you prepare. So clearly we need to do some additional procedures um, to be comfortable that those are reflected appropriately. 
and their going concern in terms of um, increased scrutiny um, through the uh, auditing requirements on going concern. So whilst within local government, you have a presumption that you will continue unless government dis determines you won't and that your services will continue. What we need to look at is um, your levels of reserves, your ability to um, meet your liabilities as they fall due um, without having to take any specific action to reduce your services. Um, so we will look at reserves, um, cash position, cash flow forecast for the, the 12 months post the, uh, the approval and um, opinion date for the accounts. Um, I said I'd mentioned materiality, but it, within local government, clearly you've got a very significant balance sheet, but actually the what your readers of your accounts are most interested is in your gross and net expenditure on services. And so that's the basis on which we set our materiality, which gives us a much lower number to then look across your, your uh, reported statements. So you'll see that we set that at 2% um, of gross expenditure um, in the year, and that comes out at just over 2 million. We'll report any differences that we um, identified during the audit um, that are over 100,000 uh, to the committee. And it would be good if the committee could confirm that they're comfortable with those when, once I've finished my presentation. The other element that I was going to take you to was around um, the value for money uh, responsibilities that we have um, within the public sector audit regime. So that's set out from page 124. And that requires us to look at um, the arrangements that the council has in place um, to secure economy efficiency and effectiveness. And in 1920, um, we're operating under what was the National, uh, National Audit Office's code that was extant at that time. It's, it's subsequently changed, but it, for the 1920 um, uh, reporting, we're required to, to um, conclude on whether or not those arrangements were appropriate and in place. And uh, we've identified at this stage one risk that we'll um, be addressing, which is around you know, the, the point that we um, raised last year and qualified on, which is, you know, have you got um, a suitable arrangements in place to uh, produce reliable and timely financial reporting? So um, we'll continue to do up, update our assessment on that before we report, and then we'll include commentary on that within our audit results report at the conclusion of the audit. So I'm going to stop there, but more than happy to take comments. And um, to uh, Peter's point, it, you may find it helpful to have Mark just give you an update on where we've got to on the progress of the 1920 audit. Uh, thank you, Janet. So I'll, as Janet says, I'll just uh, quickly comment on where we are with the 1920s. So following on from uh, Peter's comments, we agreed uh, with officers back in uh, June what work we'd be able to commence um, through June and July, and that was based on the uh, working papers they were able to produce. So these were based on working papers, not on the draft statement of accounts, because they weren't available until um, a few weeks ago. So the main areas we've been focusing on is around the balance sheet. So things like debtors, creditors, the cash balances, and also elements of the PPE, such as valuations. Uh, the work has, um, so far, we've made reasonable progress against the plan we agreed with management and officers, and I'd say our initial findings are that there is an improvement in the working papers and the, the transaction listings and the evidence that's available in a shorter time frame than we've probably seen in prior years. So there is a, a definite positive trajectory um, for 1920. Clearly, that's at a point in time, looking at a, a small proportion of the accounts We'll come back um, later in the year to complete our work and hopefully that that trajectory will will continue. Um, but as I say, so far, a positive trajectory. And I think that's all I wanted to say on that at the moment. But but similar to Janet, happy to take comments of that or the audit plan. Thank you both uh, very much. And um, perhaps for the benefit of those of us who are uh, slightly newer to this committee, um, uh, how would you contrast your experience of the audit so far with, say, the previous audit? Do you want me to pick that up, Janet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think as I mentioned, so overall we are in a better position. So the, what we've found in prior years is that the council's ability to support a balance it presents in its statement of accounts. So what we look for as auditors is, is clearly 
you know, for any given balance, there'll be a, a listing of transactions, which we'd then go sample, and then we'd, we'd collect the evidence to support um, those transactions we've selected. So what we've looked at so far, the, uh, the council's ability to support those balances and the working papers they've provided through a transaction listing and evidence has been has been better than in prior years. Um, there's probably some way to go, and I think as Peter suggested, that, you know, it's baby steps in some respects, but uh, we are showing a, definitely a better picture than prior years for those balances we've looked at so far. Thank you. Um, please uh, indicate if you want to come in on this item. I'm going to start with uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, and my uh, questions are probably directed in three different directions. Um, so I will focus firstly in relation to those two that I believe would be with EY if that's okay with you, Chair. Um, so looking at page 112, uh, I see the new risk, essentially we've got a new expert. I'm, I'm just wondering how serious a risk do we, do we take the fact that if we've got something new, is it just because it's a change? I mean, the clue is expert in it. We've not gone and asked Joe Bloggs off the street to do things. So if you could give some uh, explanation as to why you, you are untrusting of experts. Um, you also mentioned in your opening statements about being sceptical, but obviously for, you have to have, for your ethical standards, open-mindedness. So can you uh, assure me from your opening remarks that you will be treating this in an open-minded manner as required to do so? Um, in relation to page 125 and 126, you have done a value for money assessment. And of course, we have to do this with all things. Um, I'm just wondering whether you reflect on your own value for money in your assessments, or is that something reserved for the council? Um, and on 100, page 138, Chairman, I have a series of questions, as you may gather, so happy to uh, pause if required. Um, but I'm sure Ms. Ms. Dawson Perhaps can Perhaps we handle take them. those. Um, let's take those questions so far, and then uh, and then come back to you. So, uh, yes, would, uh, would either of you from Ensign Young like to respond to any of those? Yes, more than happy to. So, um, international standards of auditing require us to understand what the organisation has done to report out its numbers and where it chooses to rely on an expert. We then need to determine you know, the basis of that expertise, as it were, to then um, understand what those qualifications are, understand the methodology that's been adopted, and then look at the work to be comfortable that that's appropriate. And, and where it's a very complex position, for example, um, in pension liabilities with actuarial advice, we would tend to use our own specialists or experts to, to look at the work and to re-perform some of that to um, assess whether it's been done to an appropriate standard. So um, Councillor Williams is right. Where there's a change, we would then question what's the basis of that change and who is now doing the work. And then we need to go back to that sort of square one and understand what work they've done and why they are classified as an expert to be able to build assurance that they've done it, they are appropriate to be doing that work and uh, they've done it appropriately so that the number is um, reliable. So that's the, the first question. She's absolutely right on ethical standards and a requirement to be um, open-minded. We then come down into the you know, requirements of um, auditors and again, international standards of auditing, which in, uh, require us um, to be skeptical in our mindset for work. And also the Financial Reporting Council sets that within the UK of auditors, that is an expectation that we come with a skeptical mindset and look for counter evidence, um, uh, contradictory evidence, and challenge management's assumptions and um, uh, positions to be able to determine that we have sufficient comfort over what they are telling us and what we're reporting on. Um, so it's a it's an interesting situation to come open mindedly but skeptically. So um, you know we that's a balance that we have to we have to bring to our work. Um, on the value for money assessment, now clearly we're looking at the arrangements in place um, that the organisation puts um, to achieve value for money. We don't assess whether or not you have achieved it. And obviously within our own operation, we continually assess for quality um, and efficiency to make sure that we are um, carrying out our work in, in accordance with our regulators. 
don't know whether you want to go on. Ms Dawson, I have some further questions um, as a councillor of this committee. Um, and uh, so you've just said about your self-assessment. So I would be interested to hear your self-assessment and what improvements that EY would be making as I think to say that we have been disappointed as a committee is an understatement of the service that we have been given. Um, and with that, I will draw my next question to page 138. Uh, I assume you've not put any years on there, and some people may think this is a sarcastic question, but I think in the current circumstances, it's quite a genuine one. I take it you're referring from March 2022 to February 2023 of which point we are already through some of it. Um, so I want to know if you have the resources allocated in place and whether you will be resourcing fully um, what is in front of us and clarify which year. Uh, and then page 144, Chair, the words that came to mind when I read this were probably unconstitutional and I cannot use. But um, we had, Chair, a very frank discussion around fees at our previous meeting, of which Ms. Dunson, or Ms. Dawson, Ms. Dawson, um, claimed that we were never charged for delays, and yet here we see it, overruns and delays being charged for. And on the page 145, it says delays and deficiencies in the council's ability to prepare are charged for. And what we have seen is not the fees go down, which we had hoped um, and expected, but gone dramatically up. So can I ask, which is it? Are there charges for delays or are they not? And if there are not, then perhaps some uh, revision of the way that this is portrayed for transparency purposes would be quite helpful. Um, and also, you know, why on earth have we got to 350,000 we have looked previously, and I myself looked previously, when we had um, Suresh, and the failures of EY to resource on time were taken into account. Why are we not seeing this now? Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'll invite Ernst Young to uh, respond in a minute. Um, I believe, uh, I think, uh, Mr Maddock, you wanted to comment a bit on the, on the fees and where we are in terms of those negotiations, and I'll come back to Ernst Young. Yes, yeah, so I, I haven't spoken in detail to EY about the fees uh, for 18-19, but I, I do need to pick that up as soon as I possibly can. Um, but normally what would happen, um, I think that the level of fees would go to the public sector audit appointments uh, for them to, to look at and form a view. Uh, I suspect they would want to see some evidence to support the fees that are, are being requested. And, and they'll make a ruling. But I'm certainly intending to speak to EY in the first instance about the fees and, and gain a bit more of an understanding around how those have arisen. Thank you, Peter. So subject to that conversation, perhaps, uh, perhaps Ms Dawson, you'd like to respond to uh, Councillor Williams' questions. Certainly. Thank you, Chair. Um, so on the point about page 138, um, this is the audit plan for 1920. So it does just deal with this year's this year under audit and it is uh, to do with uh, 2022 so that is the the time frame and uh, as Peter and also Mark have explained we are on track with that we are resourced to do that clearly if other issues arise in the audit and there are um, you know there's further work required then we will need to revise or revisit that resource plan but as it stands at the moment we are planned and resourced to deliver to that timetable. Um, in terms of on page 144, we have had that discussion about delays and we do not charge for delays to do with EY's time and resource. These are delays caused by the council's inability to respond to our questions in the audit on a timely basis. Um, so I'm more than happy to make that very clear in the wording in here to say that these are council delays. Uh, thank you. You wanted to come back in. Thank you. We were informed by yourself um, that, not yourself, Chair, sorry, 
through you. Uh, that So delays weren't charged for. There, there was no further explanation given than that. Delays weren't charged for. If we haven't been able to do something on time, you haven't been able to do that work. So you're saying that you charge us for things that you don't do? Uh, thank you. If I can just add in before you come in, I, I would appreciate an explanation as to it, it's not immediately obvious why a delay in providing you with evidence means that you incur costs. And perhaps if you could clarify what those costs are. I mean, clearly this will all um, come out presumably as part of the review by the, um, the PSSA, but if you could give us a flavour of that, I think that would uh, help committee members understand the situation. Certainly. Um, so I think the context of the previous conversation um, was that we were being challenged on charging for delays caused by EY's resourcing limitations. So I think um, I think we need to be clear that that was the context for that previous discussion. I'm more than happy to go back um, and have uh, have a quick check of the minutes um, because to to present that it was that we did we said we didn't charge for any delays at all is is not. Um, actually the context of the conversation that we had at the previous audit committee. Um, delays for us when we are waiting for information coming through um, you know, means that we are, you know, we are unable to perform the work at the time that it's being, um, it's being resourced and we are not able to determine what level of resource we need to be able to address the issue. And quite, quite significantly, the delays in being able to get a response first time mean that we are in a position where we're given some information, we look at it again, and we determine that it's not the complete information, it doesn't support the numbers in the accounts, or actually, um, you know, it's factually inaccurate. So we have to ask another question. So, and, and actually that is the main type of issue that we experienced during the previous year's audit, which was that we were given incomplete information or inaccurate information and that we had to ask a number of times and then were delayed as a result. So again, I'm more than happy to make that crystal clear within our wording that that's the, the definition of delays as we have um, charged for within this, uh, within this report. Uh, thank you. I think the committee would appreciate um, as much clarity as you can give around those fees, um, particularly when I, I, I certainly appreciate the sentiments of what you're saying, but the uh, validity of saying, oh, well, uh, you know, something like a third of our fees is us having to ask questions a second time. That doesn't necessarily ring kind of, that doesn't necessarily add up to a third of your fees I in my head. So I think there's much clarity as you can provide. And then I think further evidence and discussions to be had between yourselves and management on this would be appreciated. Um, and, and, like if I'm, and if I may, Chair, and if I may, Chair, just, just to be very clear, it's to ask a second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. So, you know, I'm more, we really do need to understand the context of that audit last year to be able to reflect that. So we will go back and we will set that all out for the committee. More than happy to do that. I'll take it Thank through you. Peter in the first instance. Yes, I'd like to move on from fees if I can. Did, do, unless you, did you want to add something further on this matter, Councillor Ellen Williams? Great, before you do that, there's one point I just wanted to, um, uh, piggyback off one of the points you made, which was this, uh, the audit risk around the non-domestic rate appeals provision. If I could just um, just jump ahead of the queue quickly since we've brought it up already. Um, I appreciate this is a new expert and I appreciate it's a material estimate. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong, what we should be concerned about is the risk of material misstatement. And even though this estimate in itself is above the materiality threshold, it would only be misstated if it was out by a factor of, you know, two, three, four, five, six, ten. You know, if it's, oh, actually, it's out by 10%, then that's not even close to material. And it seems unlikely. I mean, we have a, we have a real value for this that went through the accounts in the past year of three and a half million. It seems unlikely to me that the value of this, the correct value of this is going to be zero or 10 or something. So I, I just want to push you a bit on why, why you think this should be an area of focus when the risk of material misstatement by an independent expert would seem to me to be quite small. If I, Mark, if I can ask yep. you. Yeah, no, that's fine. So um, I think so that non-domestic rate appeals provision is based on 
a range of assumptions on the likelihood of um, of businesses appealing against their domestic you know rates appeals uh, so different experts use different information and do that assessment differently and so with any change in expert the underlying assumptions and the methodologies they use to derive the figure can change because they can use different assumptions and different methodologies so whilst it, it is as you say, it would need to be either zero or, you know, six million for it to be wholly materially um, incorrect. It's it's the increased risk of misstatement that's that's the key there, because uh, our reporting threshold obviously is 100. We use a, a as we've put our horrible error in there is lower than the two million uh, because which reflects the risk on the audit. So, but it, it's around the has the expert use different assumptions and methodologies that would drive a differing figure and we don't know where that differing figure at the time of writing the audit plan because it was based on obviously the prior year we don't know where they have landed with their valuation so the valuation for, i'm not sure where it's landed in the 1920 accounts would sort of drive that reassessment of where we are on that risk scale i suppose all right perhaps maybe don't go to town on it um, no. <laughs> Councillor Williams, you wanted to come back in on a few uh, further points. Thank you, Chair. Um, but I, I think uh, more information would definitely be required on the fees, just as a, as a final, because I am, I am not happy with what I'm seeing, which you may have guessed, Chair. And equally, this is public money, and we have seen, you know, not the best of service from EY, in my view. Um, so I want to make sure that public taxpayer money has been spent very wisely. So if we could see that breakdown um, and not just be at the mercy of whatever figures have been plucked and put in front of us. Um, looking internally to some questions now, Chair, uh, I have some for uh, Mr Maddox and some for Councillor John Williams, who I believe is uh, on Zoom, Teams, we're on Teams today. Uh, so I'll start with uh, Mr Maddox. So we've had obviously a bit of discussion about the expert. We have changed expert. Is there a reason for this? Because obviously it's, it sent EY into a new risk. Um, and I'm just wondering who were our experts before um, to see if, you know, if there's, how do we process this? Do we see it as a risk? Um, or is this belts, buckles, braces, and a lot of extra unnecessary work? Um, and then also, resource-wise, and I note from page 111, uh, there is a reference, and I use the words of EY because unconstitutional for us to question the competence of officers, and quite rightly, but it does refer here, we found that the council had a lack of understanding of how the new fixed asset register operated. Their words, not mine. Um, have we sufficient training? Have we given, as a council, enough resources to the accounting department to have that training? And is any more required? That uh, question is probably more to Councillor John Williams um, in the support that we are giving as councillors to ensure that uh, we are resourcing and we will be going through the budget process. So are we sure that we've got enough finances to give the finance team the support they need and enough resources? I'm not expecting Mr Maddox to answer that, but that's a question for Councillor John Williams. Um, and does Mr Maddox have confidence that we, you know, we can move on from this and, and get caught up, um, caught up with things? Um, is there anything that we can do um, as a committee to support that process? Because it is in everybody's interest that we get caught up. It's, there's nobody benefits from this situation at all, other than perhaps EY's pocket. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's that's the main thing. And I I am seeking a commitment from us as a committee, I suppose, that if extra committee meetings are required to help speed up this process, I I know Council House in the past, but we are a new committee, have expressed the will and effort that we will sit in this chamber as many times as is necessary to get things caught up and we have as councillors made a commitment to officers that we will do our part but as we're a new committee we could reaffirm that commitment um, and in the 2018 accounts what we had was a subcommittee that met regularly 
uh, to go through where we were at with the audit. And given that you know, we've all got a desire to resolve this issue, is this something that the chair would think of reinstating for the accounts going forward? It was very useful and very productive, as was the meeting with the PSAA. So I realise I've covered a, a range of topics. Happy to clarify if you require, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, certainly, uh, just for my own part, I'm happy to call additional meetings of this, of this committee uh, to the extent that that's uh, necessary to uh, keep uh, bits of paper moving at their appropriate speed. Um, I'm not going to ask other people to publicly sign up to unknown meetings at unknown times in the future, but I recognise that we've had full attendance this morning and there are plenty of substitutes as well and, I'm, and the quorum is reasonably generous. I think it's three or something, so I, I, I can't imagine we would have difficulty in transacting business at those meetings. Um, I'm going to come to uh, Peter Maddock first, if that's okay. Um, I know Councillor uh, John Williams is on the teams. He's obviously not a sort of full member of this committee and is not required to attend. So I'll ask him if he wants to respond, but he may. He is a cabinet member, so I'll ask him if he wants to respond, but he may also wish to provide you with a written answer, um, which I would also accept from him in this case, since he's not uh, a substantive member of this committee. But I will come first to uh, Peter Maddock. Thank you. So the previous people that were doing the NNDR appeals provision, the name escapes me, um, but um, we had a contract with them to do the... Um, do the valuations for a period of time and that contract came to an end. So we just then re-tendered re uh, and Will 10 me came out as the best option going forward. I have worked with Will 10 me before in my previous authority and I found them to be really good at what they do. So I've got every faith in the work that they've done that, that they've calculated this in an appropriate fashion. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John Williams, are you with us on the call and do you wish to respond at this time? Thank, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm quite happy to respond. Um, this is a question that Councillor Williams has brought up virtually every time this committee's met. And my answer is the same, is that we have always provided the finance team with what they've asked for. At no point have we said to the finance team that they could not um, um, staff up to the, to the requirement that they needed to, um, to complete the, the audit, um, particularly last year's audit. Um, it has been difficult because we're all experiencing difficulties in recruiting uh, staff, uh, particularly accountancy uh, people, but I now, I now um, have every faith and confidence in the team that we have now to carry forward, the, forward this task. But to answer uh, Councillor Williams' question, as on previous occasions, there has never been an opportunity or, or, or situation where I, as lead cabinet member for resources, have not uh, agreed to give the resources that have been asked for by the finance team. Thank you, Councillor. Um, sorry, I've just remembered that Councillor William also asked about instituting a, a subcommittee. Um, my sense is at the moment is that good progress is being made. Um, so I would suggest that we get an update at our September meeting. And if we have concerns then that um, stuff hasn't moved forward as quickly as it should have done, then we can institute a subcommittee at that point to kind of take us through the rest of the year. There doesn't seem to be much point. I mean, I, I, in putting one in place for, say, August, when I think most people will be on leave in any case. Um, so that would be my suggestion there, if that's acceptable. Um, do any other members of the committee wish to uh, comment on anything in this report? Uh, sorry, here we go down the line. Uh, Councillor Jess Hales, and I'll come to you, Jeff, in a moment. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just to be clear, I agree with what um, Heather, Heather said, that we'd be more than happy to do extra meetings. So you've got two of us at least, so that's good. Um, there's a question for Miss Dawson, if I may. Um, I, I, I kind of appreciate the the new risks and the, the red flags, if you like. Um, but being a simplistic chap, I just wonder whether or not, and a newly appointed expert, apparently, so that was very kind of you, don't you? That's, a, that's a first for me. But I, I wonder if um, these are fixed, if you like, for the next year, because uh, these, obviously these are going to be public documents, or do these, do these, are these a fluid process throughout the year? So 
uh, how long does it take for us to gain confidence with the Wilkes, Head and Eve people uh, to show that they can actually do the job they're asked to do? And that then turned green, shall we say. Uh, and obviously the same for the capital accounting entries and the valuation of investments in properties, etc. and the comments that you've made. I just wonder at what point in the future do we, do we have um, a change to that? Um, that's the first thing, if I may. There's another couple of points, Chair. Um, I'm heartened that you'll be willing to give us a, a full and frank report, if you like, on the delays that you um, have outlaid, out, outlined, should I say, with regards to us as a council. And the other one was that through you, Chair, a request. I don't know who this goes to, but um, Ms Dawson made, made reference to the minutes and what have you. I wonder if that would be something that we could ask for the, uh, a, a, an absolute uh, definition from Ms Dawson as to what she meant with referring back to the minutes, that we could also then look at the minutes here. Yeah, and uh, I think that's me done. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Joan Dawson, are you happy to respond to those? Yes, absolutely. So um, you're absolutely right, Councillor, that um, the assessment of the risks is an ongoing process. It is a fluid process. So this is our initial assessment as we start the audit for the 2019-20 accounts. As we work through that work, we will be determining whether the uh, planned procedures are needed or not, depending on what we find, whether we need to do more work, whether we need to actually, we find that it's well run, it's organised and that um, we can uh, rely on that that specialist, but we'll need to do that work in the first instance for this year because of the change. Um, but as, as we go through our audit, we're constantly reassessing that, that risk assessment. And when we report back to you at the end of the audit, we'll tell you what our findings were, whether the risk levels stayed the same, whether it changed, whether it increased in, in any of the areas of risk that we've identified or any new areas of risk because that's what we're required to do to be able to adapt our approach to get sufficient assurance to be able to provide you with an opinion. So on the specifics of use of a specialist, um, if, the audit, uh, if the audit work that we carry out for the 1920 um, audit identifies that the specialist is perfectly well qualified, uses an appropriate methodology, we're comfortable that they haven't made any errors and that then their numbers are appropriate, we will reduce the risk for the following year and we'll bring it back down to our moderate level because we know that we can then rely on the specialist and we, we can do less work in that area. Um, similarly, with the accounting entries, the capital accounting entries and the valuation of investment properties, um, if, we have a, if we find that actually those areas uh, are run well, that we're able to get sufficient assurance and that uh, the information supports the numbers in the accounts, we'll take all of that into our assessment for the following year's audit. And you may well see, I mean, we would all like to see that risk level come down so that we can then move through the audit more smoothly. Um, full and frank report, absolutely no problem with that at all. Um, and uh, on the minutes, I was referring back to the minutes of the previous committee meetings where we've discussed delays in the past. So I think it was I, I was concerned that we we ensure that we're having that conversation about what we've said in the context of what the questions were that were asked to us at the time. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey. I'll come to you and then to you, Helen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, but I'd like to add um, my surprise or disappointment to um, Councillor Williams um, on the level of charges, but also I make um, a further point that um, I mean, presume that under the, the line, um, you know, risk fixed asset registers, uh, we've got 152,000 there. Now, I presume that that wasn't the planned fee when uh, this work was first undertaken. Um, and and so if that 152,000 doesn't include some of the categories under which you're um, uh, charging additional audits and overrun delays, then that sort of implies that EY didn't really properly scope the work in the first place. Um, so, you know, it looks to me as though we're, we're being um, 
penalized twice, once under the uh, category of fixed asset re registered data migration, 152,000, and then again under the 106. So, you know, I, I just think when you look at the fact that most of the overruns, as I understand it, were associated with the work on the fixed asset register, um, effectively that's almost a quarter of a million pounds. And I, you know, I don't know what your sort of day rate is, but given that we're told that whoever was working on it couldn't work on it when they wanted to, it, you know, it, just, it seems um, a little implausible to me. Thank you. Have you got anything further to add on uh, those, those points? Um, I, th I think what I would like to do is bring you that full and frank report, and it won't make pleasant reading. I'm very conscious that the people, that, you know, some of the councillors on the committee, you know, haven't been on the committee as that process is being taken. So I, I absolutely appreciate that the number um, looks highly surprising, um, and and some of you are taken aback by the the sheer magnitude of that. But I, you. Know, the work that was required to deliver that audit spanned two years. We scoped out the work that the fee starts with the PSAA's baseline fee. So we're not in a position to scope out the work and give you an associated prediction of the fee um, in the way that we would in a corporate environment. Um, so and the work around the fixed asset register in particular, you're absolutely right. There was no way that we could have scoped that it would have been so poor. So I, let, let us bring that full and frank report back to the next committee. And then I think hopefully we can um, bring that to life for the councillors who weren't present at the time. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Helen Leeming. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to go back to page 138, please, the audit timetable. Um, I'm just sort of looking at the way that this is set out. Um, please forgive me if I'm missing something. Um, we have, we've got the 1920 accounts in front of us now in July, um, but it looks like nothing's happening in August and half of September. Um, is that correct, please? Yes, so originally the audit was planned to take place um, from, we, we actually had time, and Mark can probably correct me on this, but we actually had time um, at the end of April, early May, and the council was not ready for us to come in with the substantive amount of work to be um, undertaken from uh, mid-June through to the end of July. Um, and as Peter has explained, the financial statements weren't ready um, for the start of that period either. Now, we had planned our resourcing on our, um, uh, for our uh, teams for the, throughout the summer and al allocated time for South Cam's 1920 audit through the end of April and into May, and then from mid-June through to the end of July. In order to accommodate the delays in getting access to the information we need to undertake the audit, we've then had to put in this additional substantive testing period, which, as I said earlier, is fully resourced, but we've had to move it back because our teams are committed um, through the periods of August and into September on other responsibilities and commitments. So that's why we ha have that delay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any further indications. Um, I want to make one uh, it, one very minor point, um, the risk around investment properties. Um, you say you're going to examine a sample of the investment properties, but I think there's only three, if I'm right. So are you just going to look at all three of them? We'll look at all three. Perhaps you could uh, update your, uh, your, your plan to reflect that. Um, mm -hmm. Unless there's anything else, I think I'm going to draw this item to a close. We've been asked to uh, note the report. I think we've we've done that uh, at a good substantial depth. So thank you very much, everyone, for your input, and uh, thank you to uh, Janet Dawson and Mark Russell for your contributions as well. I'm going to take um, a short um, five-minute adjournment now uh, for a comfort break, and then we will come back and look at the internal audit uh, governance update and internal audit plan. Thank you all very much. I'll see you back here in five minutes.
internal audit and corporate governance update. Oh, I apologise, we went live. Uh, so we're now resuming with item seven, because we took item six earlier in the meeting. So item seven is the internal audit and corporate governance update. Um, we're being asked to note this report. Can I ask Jonathan Tully, head of internal audit, to please present the report? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, a brief uh, topical uh, document. The purpose is to basically update the committee on audit and governance themes. We bring these to you sort of typically quarterly uh, according to how the committee cycle uh, falls. So if I could bring you to page 175 of your agenda packs, uh, that's where we are. And just to take you through some of the documents uh, and comments inside, it's not a long document. Um, starting on page 177, um, I just provide you with uh, an update uh, on the output and some audit work that we've done, some internal audit work. Um, just to note there, we've been doing a lot of work recently on grant and grant assurance for Bay as the government departments. Um, and this is in follow up to all the grant funding that they gave us um, for business stimulus grants uh, during the pandemic. Now we're getting towards the end of that process. They're looking for assurance that adequate internal controls are in place to mitigate the risks of fraud and error. And so what they're doing is reaching out to the internal audit teams locally to say, can you um, provide that assurance? They give us the sampling methodology and the sample, it's their choice of which ones to, to test, so it's independent. And then we do that and feed that back to them. Um, pleased to say that from those five that we've looked at so far, uh, they've all been good. Um, so we've given full assurance on that. Other outputs, um, payroll, which is a review we tend to do very regularly, um, just because it's uh, sort of high materiality for the council. Um, so we look at key controls just to make sure they continue to work uh, effectively, which was particularly important as we start to work differently following the pandemic. Um, but I'm pleased to say, following that bit of work, we're able to provide the committee with full assurance on that. Um, the other one that I've highlighted is uh, value added tax VAT. Um, so we've worked with the finance team to, to review that. Um, we've looked at controls. We've also done uh, substantive testing on actual transactions just to make sure that the right VAT codes were applied. Um, and we're pleased to say that, you know, generally everything's going really, really well. So we've given that reasonable assurance. Um, we have identified a couple of opportunities for improvements. Um, just tidying up some of the master data in the actual system itself will help reduce the risk of any fraud or error that could materialise in future. So that will be a positive step. Um, and also the team have agreed to help do training to some of the people uh, throughout the council because we can really help promote awareness of, of correct VAT practice that helps again reduce the chances of fraud or error materialising. So that's generally positive. Um, moving on to page 179, um, just for your awareness, I thought this would be useful is to provide, uh, provide an interim update of our work on the asset register, because uh, I know this is of extreme uh, interest to the committee. Um, we've probably spoken a lot about it all, already in a couple of the previous uh, items on the agenda. So just to pull out the relevant bits from our internal audit perspective, um, in terms of our progress, we've started the work there and it's generally looking very positive, um, which is quite good. Um, but what we have done, we've taken a pause um, just to help make sure that um, Peter and his team had the capacity to get on and deliver the statement of accounts work um, for 2019-20. Um, so we're going to reconvene, we're going to re resume the work um, in August and you can see from the previous item from Ernst & Young that sort of fits in with their, with their calendar of events. So we'll go in there and complete that work. So generally it's looking very good, but of course I have to caveat and say we haven't finished as yet. So um, you know, we'll report the final outcome once that work is completed. Um, the next thing I'd probably like to draw to your attention is on page 181. Um, so Tara Not Being King, our counter fraud manager, requested we put in a little bit of information um, about a key amnesty project which we're uh, looking to start. Um, this will help basically reduce the risk of, of fraud and error. And so it would be a useful thing for the committee to be aware of. Uh, as good counter fraud practices is, is part of our overall governance arrangements. 
Um, and then following on from that, we include fraud uh, statistics. Um, so this is just a, a retrospective look back from the previous quarter on some of the work that's been done across different uh, themes and categories um, to give you just a bit of a flavour about the work that's been taken by Tara and her fraud team. Um, and then probably the final one, which I think would be of interest, uh, if I can draw your attention to page 186, uh, training and development. Uh, so just for you to be aware as a committee that SIPFA are uh, issuing some new guidance, um, which we're expecting late summer now, um, on audit committees and local governments. So once that comes out, uh, we'll want to, to have a look at that and sort of do a self-evaluation to make sure that our terms of reference to the committee are sort of reflecting the latest best practice guidance. And I think we we're always thinking about forward plan of training that might help inform some of those uh, topics which we might want to look at in the future. So as soon as that's published, we, we will uh, we'll look at that. Um, and that was all the items, uh, Chair, that I wished to talk about on that agenda item. And thank you. Uh, so just to just to clarify before I bring in other members of the committee in terms of the uh, the training. So is, is your suggestion that we we wait for this um, updated sort of model terms of reference, decide what we want to incorporate and then on the basis of the new terms of reference, um, think about some kind of training plan for committee members? Well, yes, I mean, it would make sense, wouldn't it, to see what the latest uh, changes are. But I mean, I would say they're going to be sort of key themes which exist in both, you know, in the current standards and the new standards. I mean, a lot of things that we do are going to be the same. Um, we recently sort of benchmarked a couple of years ago our terms of reference against the current standards. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of not expecting massive change. Um, we'll have to wait and see what, what comes out with the guidance. Um, one of the things which um, and this is perhaps not so much for training, but just to be aware of, I think there's going to be a requirement for independent members uh, to be appointed to the committee, something that we discussed before, um, but because it's been spoken so much at a sort of a, a sort of a professional level, um, I think it's probably going to become quite likely that that'll be an expectation. So if there's any burning issues, we could talk, we could certainly plan them now, but we would be better informed once the new guidance comes out. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, you indicate you wish to speak. Thank you, Chair. Through yourself, can I just put a request in that, as on other reports, we do have a recommendation sheet with the, um, with the committee update report, just for transparency purposes, so the public and us know exactly what, what we're meant to be doing on these issues. Take it, it will be for noting, I know, but for transparency, Chair. Um, then on page 184, um, now, I know and have seen firsthand the incredible work and forensic work that Mr. Maddox and those in the fraud prevention team have done. And there's been a great deal of effort in, in recent years to, to pull that together and to um, you know, tackle fraud. Uh, I perhaps am a little old fashioned beyond my years, but for me, it's a very principled matter. This is not our money, this is taxpayers' money, and if somebody receives money that they shouldn't or defrauds this council, they're defrauding the pocket of all of our residents. Um, and when I look at page 184, I am a little um, concerned about the uneconomical to investigate the 12 there. Now, I do realise that you know, if it's 10p, then, you know, we have to let it go. But I would like to record, and I would welcome that other members are as well, that we should be fighting the injustice of fraud, not just even if it isn't um, financially viable to us, because we will never be able to record how much money is saved through prevention. And if people know that we will be tough on it and we will enforce it, they are less likely to try their luck. Okay, so I'm hoping that we will see some other figures, but can I just have some reassurance that our, our threshold for A14 is very, very low. Um, so that would be my first request, Chair. The other is page 185. Please, can we have some abbreviations of LAFs and LOCTA and everything else 
on the basis of transparency. I know we've had this conversation before, um, and it seems like Ripper, for example, you know, those of us that have been around a while now, we know exactly what they are, but having, for the public, having the CT abbreviated council tax, we've got some, some helpful hints there, Chair, but we haven't got a complete set of accessible documents currently. Um, so, well done to the uh, team that are looking into this as well. I know that they put immense effort and detail into it. Just want to make sure that that isn't wasted and that we do actually persecute people who have defrauded our residents. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm assuming you, did you mean prosecute in, uh, in that rather than you just did? You said, you said persecute. persecute. <laughs> Slightly prosecution stronger could be persecution, but yeah. there you go. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Peter, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that, I, I can't remember what the figure is off, off the top of my head. I can find it, but it is, it's, it's quite a low figure. We do get, particularly on um, some of the housing benefits, we do see some really quite small numbers. Um, we do do an investigation up to a point, but there does sometimes come a time when it doesn't quite stack up to to continue to pursue when we're talking about quite small amounts. Um, I think the point is really well made about uh, fraud and public money. Uh, I, I don't know whether this, whether it's been reported as committee about the work we've done on some of the grant frauds, for example. So the government COVID grants were issued at speed, and Jonathan referred to that earlier. And, and we did pursue a number of people who had claimed those grants fraudulently. We had a, we had a really quite high-profile success in relation to one of those schemes. And I don't know whether this committee has been made aware of that previously or not. I can't recall it. Um, but, you know, there are some quite high-profile high successes we, we've had, and a lot of work goes into doing that. But, it, you know, from a Chief Finance Officer point of view, it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to, to make sure that public money is used in the right way. Uh, and I, I wouldn't mind commenting a little bit more on the key amnesty as well, because that's a project we've been looking at. Um, tenancy fraud is a big area of fraud. It, it's in a number of guises. Um, but the, it, is the, it is the area of greatest risk to, to all councils that hold housing stock. Um, there are people that have tenancies that don't live there. There are people that hold tenancies with more than one council. There are people that sell their keys on to other people to live in. In the, in the property um, and we know that it's the biggest area of risk and um, it concerns me that potentially people are, uh, are holding council properties and depriving those that really should be having those council properties. So we came to the conclusion it would be a really good idea to do some joint working with housing to try and get the message out there that you know this is going on um, we've talked to tenants associations and, and tenants representatives already, and they're quite keen. Um, we're still, there's still quite a bit of work to do, but we'll bring some more information back to members. Um, there's still a couple of months before we intend to do the project. I, I think it's, it's an important project to do, just to raise the profile of these sort of things, because I think um, sometimes it hasn't in the past, and I know local authorities in particular um, have previously been criticised for the lack of, uh, of work they do in this, this, this sort of area. Um, so, yeah, thank, thanks for your comments. Thank you. I'm sure we'd, we'd look forward to some more information on that. Uh, Peter Sanford, yeah, yeah, please come in. Yeah, page 184, it looks like maybe I'm reading the numbers incorrectly, but we have 36 live investigations, but nothing has yet been brought to a conclusion. Is that just no time yet? Or? So... I think, again, the, the timing of this, this report, a lot of those have come to the conclusion in April and May. Um, so um, there's always a significant number of cases ongoing. Um, so um, we did have quite a backlog. Um, I don't know if members are aware, during COVID, we weren't allowed to um, pursue fraud to its conclusion. So we had a significant period of time where we got behind uh, and it's been quite difficult to catch up. We've got a relatively small team, um, but we have taken on a, an additional member of staff to, to clear the backlog. So we will see 
in the first quarter of this year, a lot of those 36 cases come to fruition because I know, particularly during May, we made quite a lot of progress on that. But um, unfortunately, COVID uh, you know, did create a backlog and it's been really quite difficult to resource up and, and, and get through that backlog. But we're now making really good progress. Thank you. Are there any further comments from members of the committee? Or shall we move on to the next item? Thank you. So we've been asked to uh, note the report, uh, which we have done. Thank you, Jonathan, for providing it. We now move on to agenda item uh, number eight, which is the internal audit plan. Um, the committee has been asked to approve the draft audit plan and strategy and the supporting charter and code of ethics. Uh, can I ask Jonathan Tully, Head of Internal Audit, to please present this report? Thank you, Chair. Um, so the, the purpose of this uh, report, because it is quite a long one, to break it down into some bite-sized chunks, it's to communicate the next six months of audit work, which we want to undertake. Also, feedback from work which we've done in the last six months. And that's going to enable us to have a, a current opinion on the control environments, which enables me to provide my statements in the annual governance statements. Um, and then secondly, it's to approve the plan and also the supporting charter and code of ethics. The, there's been no change to the charter or code of ethics, but we still include these annually to demonstrate how we comply with public sector internal audit standards. And it's really, really helpful for us uh, as internal audit to get that support and endorsement from you as a committee. So that's why we bring them back. Now, unfortunately, that does make it a very lengthy document, but by having that high profile is very, very good for, for our governance arrangements. Um, on page 188, um, I start to talk about the background of how we, we, we have uh, an internal audit plan. So we now operate a shorter six month plan. We've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, I spoke earlier on about the organization being agile. It's important that we as internal audit are agile as well. That helps us respond to, to lots of demands and uh, for new audit work. Um, and what we've moved to doing is providing updates through like the previous uh, gender item, sort of quarterly updates to the committee to help keep you more informed. We may bring back further supplementary reports, bigger ones like this um, throughout the year, but we're trying and keep you uh, engaged regularly. Um, and just, I suppose, to provide a bit of flavor um, about, I talk about being agile and, and demand. I mean, since even writing this report and submitting it, um, I've had a further request from central government to do another bit of audit work quite quickly, another bit of grant assurance work on COVID related grants uh, for a protect and vaccinate scheme. So it gives you a bit of a, a feel for how the, what the pace of change is like these days. So at, attached to the report, uh, uh, the, the basically the four appendices, the audit plan, appendix B, the update and opinion, and the charter and then the code of ethics. So I'll, I'll briefly try and pull out for you the, the important salient points. Um, so scrolling through, it's page 192. This is about how we sort of identify work in the plan. And so we have lots of consultation with various people. Um, I have a big universe, so I call it, you know, we have all the potential audits we could look at. And um, I sort of benchmark with peers and professional people to work out what thematic and emerging risks are. And then once we've got that, we go through a continuous process of evaluating uh, these reviews to try and work out what we think are the priority items. And it's a constantly shifting uh, sort of landscape. On page 193, um, it's helpful to talk about resources. Um, councils are big and they're complex. We do a lot of different varied activities. So it's safe to say there's always going to be more demand than what we've got resources to, to deliver. Um, you know, to order an counts on its entirety would probably take five years. So that's why we prioritize the work uh, on the basis of risk. Talking of risk on section five on the same page, I've just provided a little graphic, which are some of the topical risk themes, which are sort of you know emerging at the moment. And these are some of the factors that have helped inform my plan. On the next page, 194, um, I talk about assurance type and key themes, and that these are things which are really useful uh, for us because it helps to communicate the different types of reviews that we do and the different lenses that we, we look through our work. So the first one, the first table, 6.2 there, it sort of articulates that we have 
corporate plan objectives. So these are always going to be risk based reviews, things which should help us deliver our corporate priorities and help mitigate the risks of things going wrong. Then we've got things which are core assurance reviews. These are things which are crucial, critically important, or they may be things which are statutory and mandatory for us to complete. Um, and we've been having a lot of those recently. Um, I just mentioned we've had another grant certification request come in. They fall into that category. And then we may have third party uh, assurance as well, where we may take assurance from partners or other people that have done work in that area. We try to avoid duplication because that creates an unnecessary burden on, on the teams being reviewed. So we do try and work effectively with our, with our partners. And that could even include working effectively with Ernst & Young as our external auditors too. Um, on the following page, table 6.4, these are what I would sort of suggest looking at the reviews we want to do over the 12 months are the key themes. Transformation and continuous improvement is very, very important. Resilience and recovery, of course, looking at how we've been adapting to rapid change across the council. Um, and that becomes almost a standing item in a lot of reviews that we do. How are you working differently? Are there any changes to the control environment? Um, governance is always going to be a key thing there because we need to provide that assurance for the annual governance statements. Counter frauds, um, as we've mentioned earlier, there's been a higher risk profile, I think, recently, mainly because of the business grants. Um, so mitigating that fraud risk or at least making sure there's adequate controls in place and providing assurance back to you as the committee has been an important uh, aspect of what we've been doing. And so that features very much in our plan. And then finally, of course, environmental. Um, so we consider that during our audits, we're actually undertaking a couple of environmental audits. It's something that we've done for quite a period of time now at this council, which is quite positive. Um, so we feel that's a very important theme. And then I can't do deliver the report without mentioning the paragraph underneath follow-ups. It's important to mention that where we issue reports and there's a high level of actions, which are very, very important. We will follow those up. We will go back to the teams, see how they're progressing, um, just to make sure that they have been implemented um, and that we can get improved level of assurance uh, from the team. Um, so if I was to go forward now, let's have a look at page 197. So this is the overall summary of the internal audit plan. Um, so I look ahead for six months of work because that's realistically what we can we can sort of plan for now. But as with budgets, I tend to think over an annual cycle and this is how I feel our resources are going to be allocated throughout the year. 400 days of work split amongst different themes. And what I show here is the current year and previous year. And this is to sort of communicate to you as a committee how the type of work we do may be the same or it may change. Now, I think this year, I think it's going to be a change. Um, for the past two years, we spent a lot of time on business grants, which was much more consultancy work rather than standard assurance work. And I think now we've come to the sort of end of that process, we're going to see more of a uh, return to traditional type assurance reviews. Um, I'll caveat that. There's obviously a lot of important things going on in the world at the moment um, with sort of the cost of living and the global uh, issues. So that may change, but I, you know, at this stage, we're anticipating a return to more normal reviews. Um, then on page 198, this is the list um, of our planned review for the six months. So it's split into corporate plan objectives and core assurance work. Um, and it gives you just a flavour of what we're trying to look at. Um, and what I would say is what we're looking for from the committee is, are there any other high critical areas which you might want us to review? This is a good opportunity, a good forum to raise them. Um, and then we can start to consider adding those to, to my plan. Um, the corporate plan objectives, those are the risk-based ones as I said earlier on. The core assurance work, this is the sort of statutory stuff. And so we've already made a start on that in some areas. You'd be pleased to hear. Um, what I would sort of uh, highlight um, is that um, I've put in the report the financial management code twice. And it's not because it's that important that I want to review it twice, but it's just um, I changed the category and I unfortunately didn't re uh, remove it from the other table. So it's in there as both core assurance work, which is what it should be, uh, and also risk based work. Now I've put it in as core assurance because it's a key component of the annual governance statement. Um, okay. 
Um, on page 201, um, this is a chart uh, which I put in to illustrate the type of assurance we provide. And I think what we can say here, the key point is we're spending a lot of time on compliance work at the beginning of the year and a lot of time on that grant assurance work where I mentioned we're doing the grant certifications. Um, I expect those to reduce over the longer term and there'll be more of an increase in the other types of assurance types listed below. Um, then on the following page 202, governance, risk and control. So this is just to, to, to highlight really some of the other areas of work that we do. So it's not pure assurance work. We, because we're internal and we're uh, sort of uh, permanently working with the council, we have a great opportunity to add value across a lot of areas. And this is gets classed more of sort of consultancy type work. Um, and it's just really recognised that we do that. We feature that in the plan just for, for full um, sort of information. And that can be really helpful because rather than come along after something's happened and providing a critical review, we can proactively work with teams to avoid issues before they materialise. That's obviously a much smarter way of working. Um, then on Appendix B, which is page 204, this is our progress updates. Um, there's probably not a lot of new things here because it includes items which we've reported to you as a committee through the previous sort of updates reports that we do on a quarterly basis. But we're including it here for completeness because we know that our colleagues at Ernst & Young like to see assurance that this document is considered um, as part of the whole annual governance process. Um, so we're including it for, for that purpose. So it, it talks about some of the reviews which you already would have been appraised on. But some key points for me, Page 204, just to give you some assurances, we continue to be fully staffed uh, within the team. Um, and actually, yeah, big thanks to my team for the work they've been doing over the past uh, sort of six to 12 months because they don't come to this committee, so you don't see them. They obviously do a lot of the hard work to get us where we are. Um, then um, progress against plan, as I say, we've, we've covered this before, but it's on pages 207. So these were previously reported to the committee. Um, so other things which we include in the report, um, section seven on page two on one, the National Fraud Initiative. Um, this is where we extract data from systems for uh, collation nationally. Uh, other councils do this and it goes into a big part managed by the cabinet office. And we use that to help uh, identify cases of, of fraud and error. So we've continued to work on that over the past 12 months and we're gonna be starting to prepare for the next exercise. The next big data extract is going to be around October time. Um, and then, yes, mention business grants, of course, because that that was a, a, a significant amount of our resources consumed on that. Um, I'd like to just verbally confirm that we're maintaining compliance with the public sector internal audit standards. Um, so we make reference to that in the reports and that's on page 212. And then we'll say we get to the internal audit charter. This it's a document which hasn't changed since previously, but it's important for you to, to be aware of and, and support because it's, it's our right of access. It sets out what we're going to do uh, in the council, so very important for us. Uh, code of ethics is what we comply to um, each year, so again, very important. And then hopefully, if you find it useful, we like to include a glossary of terms because we, we are guilty of using a lot of acronyms and in internal audits, so I hope you find that useful. Um, so that's me walking through the report. Happy to take comments and questions. Thank you, Jonathan, and, and thank you to uh, both the work of yourself and your team in uh, bringing this plan together and for the work that you've done over the past, uh, well, past several years, really, which I appreciate have been uh, very challenging. I'm sure you'll be glad to get back to a bit more business, business as usual, and some kind of core internal audit work. Um, comments uh, from the committee, please. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Hannah Williams indicated. Thank you, Chair, and through yourself. Um, Focusing on pages 216 and 217, um, I just want to have assurance from Mr Tully that uh, the shared service, it's obviously not under our direct control, but the shared service is supporting uh, Mr Maddox and the team. In with, you've mentioned a lot about working with EY. What I would like is maybe a little less of that and a bit more support of our team that are, are working to you know, try and resolve these issues. So can we have your assurance that 
the internal audit are supporting our finance department? Um, and is there more that you can do? And if so, how do we make that happen? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Williams. Ab absolutely. Um, I've, I mentioned EY because it's often, often overlooked and it's just trying to provide the committee with the reassurance that we're not doubling up on work, we're trying to be as efficient as possible. Um, but yeah, I absolutely, I work with, with Peter quite a lot. We have regular catch-ups. Um, in terms of the work that we do, we try to proactively support. Um, and that, that there's two big factors here. It's looking at, at, at the work they're doing to help identify improvement and controls. Uh, to get things working as quickly as possible, but also, as I mentioned in the, in the uh, update earlier on, it's trying to time our reviews so that we're not being a burden and giving Peter the chance to prioritise those key bits of work. So, yeah, it's really important that, that Peter and I maintain that regular dialogue, and I certainly do that with Peter. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I think Peter Maddock wants to come in, and I'll come back to you. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I'd endorse everything that Jonathan said there. Quite a lot of the work that the internal audit team do is a little bit behind the scenes. So it's it's supporting stuff that then uh, details, you know, that then goes into the audit. So yeah, I'm more than happy with the work that Jonathan does. Um, and it also provides significant support to our corporate fraud team as well. The two teams work together very closely. So those are the accountancy and corporate fraud are obviously the two areas where they, uh, you know, sort of deal with us in, in finance most. Uh, and yeah, the support is very good, very helpful, timely. And always useful. Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Williams, you want to come back in? Thank you. Thank you for that reassurance from, from both of you. Um, I'd also, and this will be the first time I think I have ever said this, um, and Councillor Howes has obviously known me for quite a long time now, and I'm normally hating to uh, the word duplication, I'm very cautious of. In this situation, however, only this situation, if some duplication is required in order to help with that process, please do it and, you know, please do help. But I caveat it, Chair, because it pains me to say it. As an accountant, we don't like waste, but I, I wouldn't consider it a waste in this case. I think it would, it perhaps would be much um, necessary and appreciated support. Thank you for those uh, comments. Um, Councillor uh, Joyce Hales, I think you want, oh, sorry, no, sorry, Councillor Jeff Harvey you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, I'm looking at um, page 210, um, which is carbon management. Um, sort of interest to me as, as one of the vice chairs on the Climate and Environment Committee. Um, and I, I hadn't realized that um, this is where our data on carbon is coming from, your department, so that's great work. Um, I'd like to raise that, I think, 3.5% of global emissions is down to data processing. And when I last checked on this, um, we, we kind of haven't really got a handle on this. I mean, if you remember going back three or four years ago, we used to have a, a data processing room um, within uh, South Cam's Hall. And at that time, the base load consumption there was 100 kilowatts. So um, that would have translated into um, 200 tonnes a year of carbon, which I think is quite a significant amount. And of course, if the data processing room were still there, then we'd be able to account for that and the reduction of that um, due to the new solar panels we have in the car park, which I think everyone agree are rather splendid. Um, but the problem is that since then, um, the data processing center became a sort of uh, shared service undertaking. I think uh, we were first told it had been relocated to Pathfinder House, and then I think some of it was then at Shire Hall. I presume it's no longer at Shire Hall because the uh, county have now relocated to Alconbury. Um, but the point is, unless we actually have a handle on this, um, we can't really do anything with it. I mean, for example, if we knew um, where the shared service were locating um, this equipment, um, never mind what our share of it would be, then we could start looking at, well, for example, our new um, microgrid um, facility that we're hopefully going to be building uh, at Water Beach to support the waste operation service. I mean, there may be a possibility that we could sleeve some of the power from there using peer-to-peer -peer in order to power the data processing. So I think it's just important that we get some data on that because without data, we, we're kind of really stuck.
Thank you, Jonathan. Was there, Jonathan, was there anything you wanted to uh, wanted to, to add on that? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I was I was taking note of what you said. Um, there are some really good good points, and we'll make sure that we pick that up uh, going forwards. Thank you. Uh, any further comments from uh, members of the committee? Uh, Councillor Helen Leeming. Hi there. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I would like to uh, propose uh, something to add to the internal audit um, programme of work, please. Um, would it be possible to uh, do some targeted work around the self-service portal um, to, to check how, how that's functioning, how it interacts with sort of standard, the more standard approach through the council? Thank you, yes. Um, that, that is something we've got in our forward plan going forwards over the longer term. It is actually a thing which I probably had scheduled around um, the end of the financial year or beginning of, of the new financial year. Um, so yeah, you'll please me know it's on our long term plan. Uh, I suppose the question would be, are you happy with that sort of time scale or would it be something that would need to be accelerated? Could I ask about the volume of transactions that are now going through the self-service portal? I think that, that, that would mm. um, influence my comment on that. Okay. Well, if, if it's okay to, to leave it as it is positioned towards the sort of the end of the financial year, um, I can just provide you assurance that it's in our, in our plan going forwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, there were two uh, items that had been suggested to me as um, possible uh, areas for internal audit to look at. One was on the um, kind of completeness of the land records that the council holds. So less on the kind of valuation side or more on um, uh, yeah, have we clearly identified all the kind of parcels of land that, the, that, that, that are owned by the council. I appreciate this is difficult in a, in a rural environment, but I wonder if you could, um, if you could comment on that and whether that's part of, uh, part of your, work, uh, your work plan in the future. Thank you, yes. It, it's, uh, it is part of our, our work plan going forwards um, because it is a, a challenge, isn't it, in, in rural areas. There's, there's potential scope for, for, for discrepancies. So um, it's kind of scheduled uh, around 23, 24, early 23, 24, but we could accelerate bringing that forwards. I've already been having discussions um, with my auditor who's been working on the uh, actual asset register review, and there's some clear synergies there um, with him developing his knowledge and understanding of the system. Um, I think it is a sensible thing to do, um, and we can certainly we can be sampling things back to other data sets um, to provide assurance that things have been recorded, accounted for, or if there's anything which requires updating, additions or deletions. Thank you. I, I mean, I think given our wider, you know, the, the wider uh, issues around the asset register, it might be uh, worth, and given that you're working on that at the moment to kind of take full mm. value of that synergy, I wonder if perhaps that it might be worth pulling that forward slightly um, but mm. I'll, I'll leave you i'll leave you to to consider that um and uh, there was a the other area that was suggested to me was around um kind of management accounts and budgetary control um i think given i suppose given some of the things we've been hearing about um kind of historic processes for production of the annual accounts as a kind of natural follow-on question as to you know what's you, you know uh, the, the process for kind of more regular kind of monthly management accounts and how budgetary control is exercised is, is does that feature in your in your audit plan uh yes it, yes it does um it, again it is one that's probably a little bit further in future um it's one we had probably scheduled ar around the end of uh, the financial year or beginning of the next one so it's definitely on our forward plan conscious that we have had new financial systems implemented um so yeah we're keen to look at that uh, the various different components and aspects of it to do with the data going in being loaded the budgets being set uh, and around the regular reporting um around how managers and what their involvement is in, in the forecasting updating with actual figures and then the outputs uh, of that um peter and i've already been having conversations early conversations around that audit and what it could look like um and i think in the context of the statement of accounts um there's no concern um because they sort of exist um well, i don't know what the correct word to say is but they're not dependent upon each other and that the, the late statement of accounts doesn't mean that we're not doing regular budget monitoring it, it is there but as I say, it would be good to provide the committee with that assurance that it's working well. 
Yeah, thank you. I think I'd be I'd be keen to see that come to the committee. I mean, it sounds like it's already relatively uh, soon in the pipeline anyway, but um, I would be very keen to see that come to this committee. Are there any final comments on this before uh, we close this item? Not seeing anyone waving desperately, so we are asked to uh, approve the draft audit plan strategy and also approve the supporting charter and code of ethics. Are we happy with all of that? Not seeing any disagreement I think we can uh, yeah that's that's affirmed thank you very much um, we move on to thank you very much uh, Jonathan Tully for your time today um, we now move on to uh, agenda item number nine uh, it's an update on the use of regulation of investigatory powers act known as RIPA uh, could I please ask Rory McKenna the monitoring officer to present his report uh, thank you chair so chair through you the purpose of the report is to update members of the committee on the use of RIPA powers since they last met. Uh, now, those members who are returning will be well used to this report. It is a short report, um, and the committee are to receive quarterly updates on the use of RIPA powers. Now, RIPA regulates covert investigations by a number of bodies, including local, uh, local authorities. Um, the Council comprehensively reviewed its policy in September 12, and it was last updated in March this year. Uh, the Council was the subject to a uh, remote inspection in February 21, and I'm pleased to say that uh, it concluded that the information provided demonstrated a level of compliance that removed for the present requirement for a physical inspection. Uh, Chair, I can uh, report that since the committee last met that RIPA powers have not been used. Uh, and that's the end of my very short report. Happy to take any questions uh, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions on this report? Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Mr McKenna, for your, your moment at the end of every audit meeting. Um, but I, and I say this because um, you do always have to wait for us, no matter how long our meetings are at the end, for this agenda item. So I'm just wondering, is this a meeting that you would normally, through yourself, Chair, normally have to attend, which case there's no issues with being at the end, or could we take mercy on you and, and bring it to the start of the meeting? I, I, I did ask Mr McKenna if he wanted to go early on, and he said you said you were happy as a, to just attend remotely at the end. But uh, I, I, I'm, I'm at the hands of the committee, as I say. Patrick uh, kindly gave me a, a, a nudge at the previous item to to join. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to join, happy to take it at the start and get it out of the way. Actually, maybe doing it at the start would be would be would be better if the committee are happy with that. Yeah, I'd be happy to see this item taken first in future meetings. We take note of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks. Second that, Chair. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're asked to uh, note that the Council's not used surveillance powers since we last met. Thank you very much. Item number 10 now, please. This is a uh, matter of topical interest. It's the opportunity for uh, officers, uh, members uh, to raise any matter of topical interest. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams would wish to raise a matter of interest. Not with an exasperating tone, I'm sure, Chair, but um, if, you, if we don't get it sorted soon, you will become very familiar with the effect, audit effectiveness toolkit that I've asked for at nearly every meeting and be assured it will happen since 2018. Um, I feel I'm so committed to this now, Chair, that I have to keep asking for the question. Um, but especially with what's going on, um, I think there is an obligation on us as councillors to reflect on ourselves just as much as, as you know, officers for their work and the external auditors. We're all part of this system. We, we all have to function correctly. So um, for the first time of asking yourself, Chair, um, although I would say your, your previous chair um, at the last meeting committed to the effectiveness toolkit. So I wait for an update with bated breath and... Some some weariness. Uh, thank you, Councillor. So, uh, just for my benefit, so this is a toolkit that would form uh, a sort of training element for the committee for members to undertake. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, uh, so, um, thank you. I, I can confirm that Heather has been asking for this for some time. <laughs> um, it, it's a it's a toolkit that EY have. Um, interestingly enough, I was actually discussing with. It's with Jonathan, was it last week or the week before? Um, and we think there's actually something better. I'll take 
Well, I, um, uh, Jonathan probably knows more than me about this, but um, we, we had a bit of a discussion, uh, and I forgot what it was called. Jonathan, can, can you recall what we were? Uh, thanks, yeah. I, I think the, the EY toolkit was based on good governance for, for audit committees in general. And when we're looking at it, it has this, um, you know, assessment criteria at the back. I think if we can wait till late summer, what we'll probably see with the SIP for guidance on audit committees is a evaluation toolkit in the back of that. Um, I haven't seen it, so I can't make any promises, but that would be my expectations. And I would expect that it's probably also going to be tailored to local government rather than a more general um, sort of audit committee toolkit, which is what EY were offering. Um, so I, I, I'm loath to make promises on something which might not materialise, but I'm, I'm reasonably confident that will come later in the summer, if that's any help for you. Thanks, sir. Councillor Joe Salter, you want to come in? Oh. Yep, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to congratulate Mr Maddock on Slope Shoulder and well done to Jonathan. That was a, that was a perfect move. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, sorry, Councillor, do you want to come back in? Yes, thank you. Can I make a suggestion? Because I, 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 I don't want to move, leave any time on this, but we do both. I think we have, a, we have an issue with audit in particular, so let's make sure that we are fully briefed. We need to do our part as well. We haven't ever had sort of training as in relation to audit other than a workshop in 2018 and a sit for day. So I know there's been, you know, I just think it would be a productive, useful thing for us to do and um, make sure that we're doing our jobs properly as well. Let us all reflect, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I mean, I'm not averse to the suggestion that we do both, um, if, 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 that, if that's not going to be a uh, duplication. Um, so, uh, happy to do that. But perhaps, um, perhaps we investigate both and come yeah, back we'll in September with a, with a full training plan, or at least the start of a training plan that we can then work on over the next uh, yeah, couple um, of years. And I can't remember, as I mentioned, we're, we're hoping to do some training on treasury management. Yes, I think uh, we... As yeah, soon as we, we possibly that. can, because I think that's an area. I think that's, that also sounds like it's going to be an area of interest as well. Thank you all uh, very much, members. That was a, a, a long meeting, but I think a very useful and productive one. I'm very grateful for all your input. Thank you very much to uh, Jonathan, Peter, uh, Patrick, and uh, Jonathan again. Um, <laughs> everyone's got the same names. Uh, and, and, and Rory as well for your contributions. I'm going to close the meeting now at five minutes past one. Thank you all very much. The date of the next meeting is the 29th of September at 10 a.m.